Mm. Yeah. The meeting, the committee meeting will come to order. I want to welcome everyone and I want to thank you for joining uh, us today to have our hearing, which is entitled The Review of the State of the Rural Economy with Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack. After brief opening remarks, members will receive testimony from our witness today, and then the hearing will be open to questions. Without objection, the chair may recess the committee subject to the call of the chair at any point during this hearing. And now I just want to give my brief opening statement. I want to welcome everyone who are watching today with this hearing. And I would like to start by, first of all, extending a warm greeting to my dear friend, uh, Secretary Vilsack. And uh, we're delighted to have you with us today, Secretary. Now, a key function of our House Agriculture Committee is to conduct oversight and ensure that the executive branch is implementing congressionally authorized programs as they are attended. Uh, one other thing, the secretary has a hard stop at 2 p.m. And also, when we return after our work period, uh, we will begin to take up the 2023 Farm Bill. Um, Secretary, with that, we're going to hear from our ranking member with any opening remarks he has. Well, Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Secretary, good to see you. Uh, welcome to Capitol Hill. Uh, glad to have you here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thanks for holding today's hearing, and thank you, Secretary Vosak, for traveling to Washington, D.C. to join us. This, this committee is well overdue for a, a general audience with you, and I, I want to mention in advance that I appreciate your willingness to appear before us to respond to each member's questions and concerns. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I was pleased and, and hopeful when President Biden asked you to join his team. Uh, your experience, um, uh, the, uh, uh, during the President Obama's administration and quite frankly the years in between uh, it was appreciated and like, uh, like that of your predecessor would continue to cultivate and execute the policies and necessary to make rural America thrive. But as I travel the country, those who produce the food, the fiber and the energy that keeps this country running are telling me a, a different story. Unfortunately, I'm also seeing it firsthand throughout my home state of Pennsylvania. You know, President Biden is has fostered an agenda that is kind of um, rife with executive overreach and regulatory uncertainty and a, and a far left ideology that just doesn't align uh, with the hardworking men and women who enrich our, our nation and our world. Uh, uh, Mr. Secretary, our constituents want a government that works for them as an advocate for their businesses, their products, and their livelihoods. And I, I'll tell you at this stage, folks do not believe this administration's in their corner. Farmers, ranchers, and foresters and consumers are battling significant supply chain disruptions and rising energy and input costs, increasing inflation, and long-standing labor shortages. And these strains exacerbate the ongoing challenges of production agriculture. As you know, Mr. Secretary, our communities are looking for solutions, and they don't need onerous federal regulatory burdens and mounds of new red tape from WOTUS and NEPA to controversial livestock rules and other regulatory actions. That's what, uh, uh, that's what they and we are witnessing. Now, our nation's ability to provide its citizens in the world with the safest, 
most affordable and abundant food and fiber supply is our fundamental mandate. And I, I know all of us and both parties realize are motivated by this tremendous responsibility. Unfortunately, there remains a disconnect between our shared mandate and what's coming out of Washington. In Congress, trillions in ideological new spending uh, was contemplated and uh, signed into law when instead we needed targeted fixes to supply chain bottlenecks and labor shortages. And now it appears further funding is under discussion that fails to address the frail Biden economy, including the massive labor shortage shortfalls. Under this administration, we see a, a Clinton era swine inspection program rolled back despite being grounded in science and designed to enhance processing capacity, efficiency, and food safety. Now, we need greater certainty and supply chain resiliency for both producers and consumers. On other fronts, domestic productivity relative to resource use for agriculture is up a whopping 287% since the 1940s. I think that's something that we all should be very proud of. While the total farm inputs remain mostly unchanged. Our producers have spent decades showing the world that they are the answer to reducing global uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and they are not the problem. Uh, activists with low knowledge of production agriculture are, are, are winning the day. And I hope this administration and department rethink their alliance with these coalitions and ideologues. Mr. Secretary, I want to be your partner. Uh, uh, makeshift responses to congressional inquiries and in many cases, no response at all have made it extremely challenging for my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, myself included, to maintain a meaningful dialogue with the department um, policy briefings and administration updates with little to no notice for members further strain our partnership. There is an opportunity to work together. Uh, I believe that wholeheartedly, and we stand ready. A critical part of doing so is beginning our 2018 Farm Bill implementation and oversight process and working towards the next reauthorization. Uh, that's putting politics aside. Uh, that's what we tend to do here in the Agriculture Committee and beginning an earnest, deliberative process of what's working, what's not for producers, rural communities, and consumers. I look forward to starting that process with our members and with you, Ms. Secretary. Uh, but in the meantime, we must stabilize our economy and supply chains, improve labor force participation, deliver common sense regulatory action, and better understand the needs of our shared constituency. I think that starts with this hearing, so I'm very appreciative of the chairman for this hearing. Um, and again, I thank the secretary for uh, coming before this committee and look forward to a more productive and consistent uh, discourse. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member. The chair would request that other members submit their opening statements for the record. So the secretary may begin his testimony and to ensure that there is ample time for questions. Our witness today is our 32nd Secretary of Agriculture and a great ally of our nation's farmers and ranchers, Secretary Tom Vilsack. We are so pleased to welcome you back to our Agriculture Committee. And Mr. Secretary, please begin when you are ready. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very, very much and appreciate the opportunity to be here today. And also uh, to uh, Representative Thompson, thank you for the opportunity to appear uh, before the committee and thank the members for this opportunity. You know, I, I suppose I could focus on the fact that our farm income is as good as it's been in the last eight years that we've had record exports, but I'd really like to focus on one phrase of my testimony on page four, because I think it, it uh, explains the heart of the challenge that farmers in rural America faces and has, has faced for a considerable period of time. I want to focus on the phrase, a extractive economy, extraction economy. I, I make this reference on page four of my testimony in order to set the stage for discussion, hopefully over the long haul, as you begin your process of the Farm Bill uh, reauthorization. Our extraction economy is an economy that essentially uh, we take things from the land and off the land, and unfortunately, rather than converting them and value adding them in and close to the rural areas where the natural resource is, they are transported uh, to long distances where they are uh, value added in some other location where opportunities and jobs are created elsewhere. I think it's gonna be important for us as we look forward uh, to try to be, develop what is called a circular economy in which the wealth is created and stays in rural areas. Let me give you a couple of examples of how that could happen. 
There has been a focus on local and regional food systems. We learned during the pandemic uh, that our system, our food system, was not as resilient as we hoped it would be. Um, one of the ways of making it more resilient is to create local and regional opportunities. That's one of the reasons why we are focused on expanding processing capacity, something that I hear all the time when I travel around the country. Uh, the need for our cattle producers, our livestock producers, our hog producers to have choice and opportunity for uh, a local processing facility that creates local jobs, that allows that revenue and wealth that's created from processing to stay in the community. Another example is obviously the bio-based manufacturing. Uh, biofuels is one example, but there are a multitude of ways in which we can convert agricultural waste product into a wide variety of things beyond renewable energy and fuel to include chemicals, materials, fabrics, and fibers, again, creating opportunity for farmers and additional uh, income sources as well as rural jobs. Uh, climate change uh, creates an opportunity for us. Uh, as we look at ways in which uh, rural lands can be used to sequester carbon, as we embrace climate smart agricultural practices, it opens up a whole new vista of opportunity uh, for farmers to essentially be paid uh, for the carbon sequestration that they uh, are currently doing and will do in the future. These are all examples of a circular economy where the wealth basically stays, the opportunity is created, the jobs are created in rural areas. And we at USDA are focused on trying to insert and, and encourage that type of circular economy to be uh, more prevalent in rural areas across the United States. Mr. Chairman, I, I know that there are a variety of questions uh, that uh, will be posed today, but I hope as uh, this committee begins its serious work of the Farm Bill, that you'll uh, take uh, some time to work with us uh, to take a look at how we might be able to do a better job of maintaining and creating wealth in rural communities uh, and making sure that historically underserved populations and communities uh, also get a fair amount of attention. Uh, and we at USDA are committed to working with you uh, in partnership uh, to use the resources that are available uh, from Congress in a way that helps to create those kinds of opportunities. Uh, with that, I'll yield back the balance of my time and look forward to the questions that you all have. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, uh, for your important testimony. At this time, members will be recognized for questions in order of seniority, alternating between majority and minority members, and you will be recognized for five minutes in order uh, to allow us to get to as many questions as possible. And I will certainly hold each member to that strict five minutes because I want to be able to make sure every member has a chance to ask the secretary questions. Please keep your microphones muted until you're recognized in order to minimize any background noise. And now I recognize myself for my questions. Uh, Mr. Secretary, as you may know, our cotton industry is suffering in a very particular area with our cotton merchandisers, and they have had great impact and effect uh, from our COVID-19 crisis. As you may recall, I wrote you a letter and asked for your help and what we could do to help our cotton merchandisers. Because, Mr. Secretary, they are very critical to the risk management and liquidity for our cotton farmers. So, Mr. Secretary, I want to help them. I know you two, too, too. And so what can we do? Can we use some of your authority with the COVID-19 funds to be able to get help to them? Um, what can we do to help our cotton merchandisers? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we have been in consultation with uh, a number of representatives of the cotton industry and the cotton and textile users industry in an effort to try to determine how best to help. Uh, the FSA is in part drafting a notice of funds availability uh, that we hope to be able to make available uh, sometime uh, in the early spring uh, that, that would provide some additional resources. And we're trying to structure this in a way based on our conversations with the industry uh, to be able to provide some assistance and help uh, to the industry. 
this is one of many programs that we uh, have inserted and adopted as a result of the resources that have been made available under the American Rescue Plan and under the CARES Act and, and a variety of pandemic assistance programs designed to make sure that we have a, a significant amount of, of effort at USDA to provide assistance and help to those who uh, were not uh, adequately helped uh, in, in the previous administration with these resources. Thank you for that. And now I would like to recognize um, the ranking member for his questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary, thanks again. I uh, really appreciate you being here. Uh, uh, Mr. Secretary, as you know, and I know this is an issue important to you, dairy uh, uh, has uh, long been a priority of mine, and it's also our largest commodity in Pennsylvania. I'm, I'm, and as I talk with dairy farmers actually all across this country, uh, I know it's important uh, throughout our, um, our dairy states. Now, I'm glad that dairy stakeholders have, are having uh, serious discussions about the potential reforms to the federal milk marketing order system. And I think the system has long needed some improvements for dairy farmers. I don't think we can keep doing what we have been doing, expect different results uh, when you look at the attrition, the loss of dairy farms. Uh, but the COVID-19 pandemic has really put a spotlight on some of those deficiencies. Now, your conversations are, are still going on within the industry to reach consensus, which I, I think is critically important. But can you com uh, uh, comment or commit, uh, commit your department will work with us and in, uh, in the dairy sector to help this process along? Uh, Representative, thanks very much for the question. And, and certainly, uh, I hear, as you have heard, uh, concerns about the marketing order. And I think it is important and necessary for the dairy industry uh, to develop a consensus opinion. I think as you travel around the country and as I do, uh, what you hear in Pennsylvania may be a little different than what you hear in Vermont, maybe a little different what you hear in Idaho, maybe a little bit different in New Mexico, and certainly different what you hear in California in terms of the needs of this industry. Uh, but I think that the uh, industry is serious uh, about this effort and we will work collaboratively with the industry to try to improve. That's one of the reasons why we recently announced the supplemental dairy margin assistance, the dairy uh, payment uh, through uh, the pandemic market voluntary assistance program, and why we created the dairy donation program. We're uh, trying to find ways to use the existing tools to provide help to this industry. I do think, uh, you know, there is a, the consensus is out there, maybe not on exactly what to do, but there's a need for change. And, um, and that, that's helpful. Uh, to be able to bring people together. And so I look forward to working with you in that, that arena. Uh, Mr. Secretary, in March of 2021, you made uh, reference in a press release to gaps and disparities at USDA concerning COVID relief. And, uh, and in statements with the press since then, you've implied that uh, funding in many program areas has been uh, disproportionate or skewed upon by race. And that, that same phrase, gaps and disparities, was in your written testimony today. Now, following your initial press uh, statement last year, my staff reached out to USDA numerous times requesting to see the data that supports uh, that comment, uh, that consistent comment you've used. And, and after no response, I, I wrote to you personally asking for a response to these inquiries. And this week, and nine months after first engaging on this issue, my office received a letter acknowledging this request. Uh, the response I received, though, was merely a regurgitation of pre-existing USDA press releases uh, that I already had in hand and not the date I sought, which is disappointing. The, the timeline of the response is equally disappointing. So, Mr. Secretary, I, I know that we both agree that um, this plague has been devastating to all stakeholders and communities. And uh, this committee has a responsibility to meet the needs of uh, all producers that, that require us to work together um, and that does require us to work together. I look forward to, to us doing better. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, I believe this also highlights the need for increased oversight, Mr. Chairman, from this committee, not only on the Farm Bill implementation, but also the COVID relief. And I hope to see a greater responsiveness from our uh, USDA partners. I, I think we're all part of a great farm team. And we're, when we're working together, you know, uh, every American family benefits and, and the rural economy benefits. And so, uh, uh, just, uh, uh, I'm hopeful that we can work in a more responsive and, uh, and uh, just a, a better way going forward. Well, Congressman, I, I, I think what I, uh, what I said and what I intended was to focus on the fact that the uh, existing uh, it, assistance under the Trump administration was focused in a number of geographic areas and a number of commodities. 
And I think uh, a recent GAO study suggested exactly that. And that's one of the reasons why we use the resources under uh, the CARES Act and under the pandemic assistance resources to spread out and to try to provide help and assistance to those who hadn't received as much help. Dairy was one area. Biofuels, uh, the biofuels industry is another area. Uh, the spot market for hogs, uh, the folks who were uh, selling hogs on the cash market, that's another area. Uh, the pandemic needs of, of, of specialty crops, that's another area. So we made an effort to try to make sure that we were providing assistance and help in a comprehensive way as opposed to focusing in on a specific geographic or commodity uh, specific area. Right. I, I think that data would just be helpful, um, you know, to to, to be, to be gentleman's to time has expired. The gentleman from California, Mr. Costa, who is also the chair of the subcommittee on livestock and foreign agriculture, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for uh, bringing us together and uh, the support and opportunity to have a conversation with our Secretary of Agriculture. It's glad, uh, good to see you back, uh, Mr. Secretary. Um, we could spend the whole day talking about the rural economy and the challenges we face across the country regionally and the different impacts that this pandemic has had uh, uh, in terms of closing restaurants and schools and, and impacting our food supply chain in ways that we could never imagine. And obviously, we're still working on that effort uh, with our ports in Long Beach and Los Angeles. Uh, but I'd like to focus on a couple of areas and continue this effort as we set the table for the farm bill next year. Uh, that I know the chairman and all of us are very interested in doing. Uh, the, uh, uh, we touched upon the, uh, the effort of uh, uh, the challenges regionally of, of milk production. By the way, I want to commend you and Ambassador Tai on that resolution with Canada on uh, the uh, recent decision that was made. That's helpful, I believe, uh, to ensure we have a level playing field uh, with our neighbors to the north. But that limitation uh, on the program, uh, the volatility assistance program that you implemented to reimburse dairy farmers for their losses, obviously impacts producers differently around the country. And the limitation uh, that uh, 5 million pounds per producer obviously doesn't reflect that one size fits all. And I'm wondering, uh, we're trying to figure out uh, in areas of the country where it doesn't, uh, how we might uh, provide uh, uh, an effort to to cover the, the losses that they sustained during that time. Mr. Secretary, you care to comment? Congressman, the reason why we established that uh, limitation was the fact that uh, during the course of the uh, previous administration, the way in which uh, COVID relief was provided and helped uh, as, as it relates to the food box program resulted in a, a somewhat of a distortion in the market that created a situation where there was a significant difference between class one and class three, and many yes. producers, many small producers were hurt. And so this was designed to provide assistance and help to the small producers that were hurt because of that uh, circumstance. I'm happy to work, and we did work and are working on a variety of other ways uh, to help the dairy industry uh, across the board, and be happy to work with you on any ideas or thoughts that you have uh, to provide assistance and help. Uh, to the dairy industry. Good. We'll follow up on uh, on that. Uh, the trade issues, as you and I have discussed before, are critical to American agriculture, as well as California agriculture, the number one ag state in the nation. Forty-four percent of California's agricultural production is exported, and I'm wondering, as we look toward uh, uh, having a, a level playing field, not only with uh, our our uh, consumers uh, are ex that we export to the uh, to Asia, but also to Europe as well. And I'm wondering what kind of oversight the department intends to follow with regards to the new agreement we have with uh, uh, the U.S. Mexican Canadian agreement. Well, you alluded to the fact that we uh, supported the U.S. Trade Representative's office in connection with the Canadian dairy situation. Certainly pleased to see that uh, that uh, tariff rate quota. Uh, will be implemented in the way in which it was intended. Uh, we are working with our uh, colleagues and our friends in Mexico on a variety of issues, uh, not the least of which is uh, glyphosate, uh, biotech uh, uh, approvals for corn, uh, the ability of, for us to be able to continue to sell corn uh, for feed into Mexico, received assurances from the Mexican Secretary uh, Villalobos that, that that, in fact, will continue to, uh, to take place. Uh, so there is ongoing conversations. I've probably uh, spoken to the Secretary of Mexico uh, at least six times, seven times uh, uh, since I have took office, and I have had a number of 
responses and communications with my Canadian counterpart as well. So there is a, a, a constant effort to ensure enforcement. And this is really designed to provide, uh, to create a sense of trust about trade agreements, not just in Mexico and Canada, but also in China. Uh, we obviously have some unfinished business with reference to phase one, uh, and we continue to press China to increase their purchases and also to address many of the important uh, Do you believe China's kept their commitments under the previous agreement? No. They're, they're $13 billion short on purchases, and there are seven key areas where they have yet to uh, perform. Uh, biotech approvals, uh, DDG uh, uh, sales, uh, tariffs on ethanol, Let a me, variety of other sorts. Uh, we'll areas. follow up on them. My time's running out. I just want to commend your efforts because you and I have talked about it on forestry and the horrific fires and our ability to manage our forests in a way that really we have been neglecting. And uh, we want to support your efforts there. There's a lot to be done. This 10-year program that you unveiled earlier this week is something that we want to work with you on. Gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Austin Scott, is recognized now for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Vilsack, I have uh, talked to some of my chemical distributors in, about the crop protection products. They're telling me that the raw materials are in the country, but the labor shortage is what is creating the backup and the challenges with actually getting the product uh, to the warehouses for the farms. Is that consistent with what you're hearing from the, the people at the USDA? Well, we are certainly concerned about uh, the lack of, uh, of truck drivers, which is why we're working with the Department of Labor and encouraged by their efforts uh, to create an apprenticeship program and to speed up the process to get people behind the wheel and to work with states to, to uh, issue CDL uh, licenses as quickly as possible. So it is an area that we're concerned about. I, I, I think they're talking about shortages in labor at the manufacturing as oh. well as the trucking shortages and other things. Well, I do, it does concern me uh, that in, in many cases, I feel like people don't recognize how important the timeliness is with regard to the application of uh, crop protection and crop promotion uh, fertilizer products on to, to get the yields that our farmers depend on and we we all depend on uh, for our food supply in this country. And so I just, uh, I, hope, I hope you and USDA will stay on uh, the Department of Transportation making sure that they understand and the Department of Labor and making sure they understand that uh, when we have to have these crop protection products in the field, it, you know, putting it on two or three weeks late doesn't work. Um, you were given an additional $10 billion this past fall for disaster assistance uh, for extreme weather in 2020 and 2021. Uh, can you give us an update or any details on uh, where the distribution of those funds stands? Yes. Uh, let's talk about the $750 million that was allocated for the livestock industry. Uh, we're going to take a look at a process by which we can use existing data from the Livestock Forage Program to facilitate payments, and the hope is that those payments will be made to livestock producers uh, sometime this spring. Uh, the expectation is that there may be additional need, a second tranche of resources that will be made available uh, with a more detailed application, but we're trying to simplify the process so we can get resources to these farmers as quickly as possible. On the grain side, uh, we hope to use NAP data and RMA uh, crop insurance data to essentially create a pre-filled out application which will speed up the process of a first tranche of resources to, uh, to those producers and then a second tranche for shallow losses in areas that weren't covered, uh, folks who didn't have NAP cover coverage or who didn't have crop insurance coverage. So the goal here is to try to get these payments out uh, this spring. This spring. So ho hopefully by the end of April then. <laughs> April, May, sometime in that time frame. The key here. Uh, representative is to make sure that we get it done as quickly as possible, which is why we're simplifying the process and trying to use existing data uh, to speed up the process. Okay. Um, one last question. Uh, the Commodity Credit Corporation. Uh, I know there's a, a tremendous amount of discussion about uh, climate smart agriculture and uh, the Commodity Credit Corporation it's my understanding that a billion dollars in CCC funds are, are being used for climate smart agriculture and forestry. Uh, how does this fit under the 
pretty specific enumerated purposes of the CCC, what specific authority in the Charter Act uh, will be using? And can you give us more details on sure. this initiative? Uh, as, you, as you well know, the Commodity Credit Corporation, in part, is designed to provide for the promotion of commodities. And what we're hearing and seeing from the, uh, the industry is, uh, the food industry, is the need for climate smart commodities uh, for uh, sustainably produced commodities that, in which they can ensure their consumers that what they're purchasing is not harmful to the environment. So we want to be able to help uh, producers create those climate smart commodities. It falls under, uh, it's either section four or section five of the CCC. Uh, and we are very confident uh, that we have the capacity and ability to use this without jeopardizing any of the other needs or reasons for the CCC. This will give, uh, and it, it actually uh, farm groups and food groups have basically proposed and suggested this in the Food and Farm uh, Alliance uh, document on climate smart agriculture, suggesting the need for demonstration and pilot projects funded through the CCC, and we're following the prescription of groups like the American Farm Bureau in, in their advocacy for this. So. Uh, we feel very confident we have the legal uh, grounds based on the fact that we will be promoting climate smart commodities. Mr. Chairman, my time's expired. Thank you. The gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. McGovern, who is also the chair of our House Committee on Rules, is recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your leadership. And I want to thank Secretary Vilsack for his service uh, and for his team at USDA. Um, I have found them always to be very responsive, and I appreciate that. Uh, I want to start off by saying that I'm currently working with uh, Congressman Grijalva uh, to organize a roundtable on tribal farming and indigenous food systems. And while we all must do more to honor and learn from and the, uh, the, the experiences of indigenous people, uh, I want to thank you, Mr. Secretary, uh, and your team at USDA for all the work that you've done so far in this space. Uh, as I have pushed for a, a White House conference on food, nutrition, health, and hunger, I've had the opportunity to see a wide range, a, a wide range of, um, of uh, places uh, that are working to ensure access to culturally appropriate foods for people. For example, I was in New York City recently uh, at a place called the Met Council uh, that focuses on providing access to kosher and halal foods for those who would otherwise be forced to choose between their faith and having food on the table. Uh, many of the programs that I saw when I visited San Francisco specialize in providing culturally appropriate foods for Asian and Latinx communities. Uh, at the St. Mary's Food Bank in Phoenix, Arizona, which is the oldest food bank in America, uh, they have made it a mission to provide culturally appropriate native foods uh, for elders to eat. And so as we discuss more the upcoming roundtable, uh, indigenous people know the power of sovereignty, uh, of sovereignty and the power of making decisions that encompass your own values on behalf of your people. And we will hear about how self-government means very clearly being able to feed your people. So the U.S. federal government has much to learn from the indigenous peoples of this land. And that pri priority of, of feeding your own people uh, is one that I know I will certainly carry with me. So my questions are, uh, with that, Mr. Secretary, I'd like to know more about what USDA is doing to ensure access to culturally appropriate foods, and what uh, do you need from Congress to ensure that our food programs are meeting all the needs of all who use them? And then secondly, can you tell me a little bit more about the efforts to incorporate regional purchasing in the food distribution on Indian Reservations program? Uh, Congressman, uh, several points here. Uh, we have uh, entered into eight demonstration projects with eight tribes uh, as through our Office of Tribal Relations uh, to begin to incorporate more fully indigenous uh, foods into uh, the, uh, the foods that are available under the federal uh, uh, food program for tribes and under our, our SNAP program, uh, trying to figure out ways in which we can incorporate more fully and completely uh, the availability uh, of indigenous foods. It's not just uh, the ability of meeting the food security and, and food, uh, food needs, cultural needs of, of populations. It's also about creating opportunity and economic opportunity. And to the extent that you create a local and regional food system, uh, one that is designed to produce those culturally uh, appropriate foods, you are also creating jobs. And you are creating what I referred to earlier as a circular economy. Uh, and we are uh, continuing to work with uh, with tribes uh, to try to do more of this. 
I would say one of the challenges in this space uh, we are also trying to address, uh, and that is the fractionated uh, ownership of land, uh, particularly in tribal areas, uh, as well as uh, uh, African American uh, farmers. Uh, and this is an issue that we're trying to address with the heirs property rule that we instituted. Uh, there's roughly $120 million that's going to be made available for uh, a sort of a revolving loan fund. Uh, that will create the opportunity for people to consolidate uh, a land title, which in turn will allow them to exercise, uh, exercise and to be able to access uh, resources from USDA. Uh, and so these are, these are integrated parts in terms of what Congress can do. Uh, you know, obviously one thing you can do is, is, to, uh, you know, is to have a budget. <laughs> we think that's the first thing we'd like to see uh, because that would allow us the ability to have uh, sufficient resources to be able to provide the technical assistance uh, that is needed to institute many of these programs. And, 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 and in the general question about more access to more culturally appropriate foods, which seems to be an issue that I hear a lot about, uh, as I mentioned my visit to New York City with the, with the Met Council, uh, is, is, there, is the USDA doing anything to try to address that issue? Well, one of the things we're trying to do is to make sure that we have available processing capacity uh, that creates that culturally uh, appropriate food. Uh, and as we look at the various programs that we've announced recently to try to expand capacity and expand competition, we, we bear in mind that part of those resources need to be done to make sure that the kosher and halal uh, foods are available and that they are produced and processed in the appropriate way. Well, thank you. I look forward Gentleman's to with you. time has expired. The gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Desjardins, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Bill Sachs, great to see you here again. Uh, last time we spoke, uh, I introduced you to the issue of the black vultures, which apparently uh, we're going to be talking about some more again this year because it's, it's getting worse again. But that's not what I want to focus on today. Uh, Obviously, protecting the health and safety of USDA employees and farmers, uh, customers is of critical importance. However, as it stands today, farmers are not getting an acceptable level of service from FSA field offices that they deserve. Uh, before COVID, farmers were able to come to the office at a time convenient for them on their often strict schedules, but now they're having a hard time getting an appointment at all. Uh, meanwhile, sign up for crop year 2022 programs is imminent. When do you expect USDA field offices to return to normal operating levels? Well, Congressman, uh, you and I have obviously a difference of opinion on this because uh, we keep track of the level of work that's being done at farm service agencies to try to see whether or not the pandemic has, has negatively impacted the ability to get work done. And in fact, as we see, uh, we're, we're continuing to work at pre-pandemic levels. Let me give you a sense of this. In FY21, uh, those folks at the Farm Service Agency did 21,833 uh, direct loans, uh, 7,218 guaranteed loans, 12,244 uh, ownership loans, 12,528 operating loans, and uh, 4,270 micro loans. I mean, there was a lot of work done uh, in addition to CRP, in addition to over $7 billion of pandemic assistance provided. So the work is getting done. It's getting done because folks are working online, they're working with email, they're working on the phones, and they're working in offices. We're okay, going to be, well, I would just say we're that, be uh, happy. You know, we have the largest Farm Bureau office in the country, in my district, in Columbia, Tennessee, and this question came directly from them. So maybe I'll have someone from your staff, if you don't mind, get in touch with Tennessee Farm Bureau, because they're saying that people don't have access to the FSA office, and a lot of it's staffing issues due to the... Uh, COVID restrictions and vaccination mandates. And uh, I think uh, supposedly there was about 80 some percent compliance, 88% compliance, but those were people who'd gotten one vaccine. What is the current status? Are people gonna still be restricted from going to work if they're not fully vaccinated? Even the CDC, I think yesterday said that uh, natural immunity uh, was more effective against Delta than the vaccine. So we're in a changing process. This whole process of, of the, the vaccine ha has, uh, um, kind of mutated as we've gone along. And, and I think we need to get up with the times. Main Street businesses are getting back and running. You're saying that the, the work's getting done, but that's not what we're seeing in Tennessee. Well, there, there were a lot of loans and a lot of activities done. Let me just simply say that 88%, almost 89% of our employees are vaccinated. The compliance rate- With 97, one vaccine though, correct? I, I'm, I'm answering your question, sir. 97% 
of the workforce actually uh, is either vaccinated or has requested an accommodation, and we're working through those accommodations. If they continue to work uh, when they request an accommodation, uh, they just simply have to be masked, they have to have social distancing, and things of that nature. So 97 percent of the workforce is, is currently covered, and we're working through the remainder of the workforce, encouraging them to either get vaccinated or to request accommodation, and they uh, still have time to do that. Okay, well, my understanding was the USDA had the highest number of exemption requests in uh, all the agencies, but uh, that those won't be available. So I'm getting double information here from what you're telling me. You're saying that's not the case? That's not the case. Okay, well, that's good to know because the main thing is, you know, at least in Tennessee, I don't know about my colleagues, but they are having issues getting appointments with FSA. So we, we'd hope that could be addressed. Uh, let me finish. The, the farmers and ranchers feel like the EPA and this administration are attacking them. Um, from not defending the Trump WOTUS definition to revoking tolerances of approved crop uh, protection tools and skyrocketing input costs. I certainly understand why they, they have these concerns, Mr. Secretary. Can you tell me how you are serving as an advocate for production agriculture and defending agriculture throughout the Biden administration? You have 45 seconds, you can have them all. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, encouraging the EPA to do what they are currently doing, which is to reach out to farm groups and farmers across the country to listen to concerns that they may have about the implementation and formation uh, of the rule. Uh, and I appreciate the relationship that I have with Administrator Reagan uh, on, that, on that score. And we're also taking a look at ways in which we at USDA can provide help and assistance uh, once the rules are, are determined uh, in terms of providing assistance and help through our conservation programs uh, to be, make sure that folks are in compliance. Uh, those are our two principal responsibilities, I think, is to encourage outreach and to make sure we're using all the tools to help farmers implement uh, as uh, accurately as possible. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Gentleman's time has expired. The gentlewoman from North Carolina, Ms. Adams, who is also the vice chair of the Committee on Agriculture, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman Scott, Ranking Member Thompson, for hosting the hearing today. And Secretary Gilsack, uh, good to see you again. Uh, rural communities continue to face unique challenges that, that must be addressed to achieve growth. Our farmers need key resources to be successful, and our socially disadvantaged and small to mid-sized farmers must receive special attention so, uh, because they're more vulnerable to outside factors. Farmers continue to experience challenges presented by COVID-19, supply chains, labor market shortages, access to resources, etc. At the same time, issues of climate change and the management of uh, carbon on farms must be considered. So uh, as co-chair of the bipartisan HBC Caucus, I've got to note uh, that our 1890 land-grant institutions play an important role to contribute to research and extension and teaching and food and, and agricultural sciences. Uh, these institutions do extensive work that supports their surrounding communities, including those located in hard to reach areas. But as you know, uh, Mr. Secretary, these institutions can work more closely with USDA across the entire department. So can you speak to any collaboration on rural development, uh, rural health, climate change, and nutrition programs like WIC, where USDA can better support the work and contributions of land grant institutions to their communities and our country? I appreciate the question. I had a great meeting with the Council of Presidents representing all of the HBCUs uh, a month or so ago, and we talked about the opportunities uh, within rural development. Uh, first order of business is to make sure that there is an understanding uh, in the HBCUs of the extraordinary scope of the programs that we have at USDA and to encourage uh, greater collaboration. Uh, we're already beginning to see a number of projects, additional resources being provided. Uh, $21.8 million uh, provided the HBCUs on 58 projects to try to expand uh, their reach into the community. We'll continue to look at 2501 funding. We continue to look at ways in which we can encourage both HBCUs and other cooperators uh, to be able to provide the technical assistance and connection uh, between uh, underserved communities and underserved producers and USDA. Uh, we recently announced uh, $75 million uh, of resource uh, under the uh, American Rescue Plan to create uh, that bridge, that connection uh, between producers and uh, the USDA. Um, and we look for expansion of that uh, cooperative effort. Uh, our, our NRCS just recently announced a $50 million initiative 
uh, over 118 cooperators uh, now being uh, contracted to provide information and, and assistance in terms of conservation programs. Uh, our RMA uh, spending several million dollars to expand outreach so people understand the wide range of crop insurance uh, tools that are available. So there's a concerted effort here to make sure that we're doing a better job of connecting and certainly HBCUs are at the center of it. Thank you, sir. Um, I uh, helped author the Centers for Excellence in the 2018 Farm Bill. It's important that we work to ensure their success. But broadly speaking, how can uh, uh, NIFA, NFIA, better support land-grant institutions as, as it relates to the Centers uh, of Excellence? There, there, uh, we recently announced uh, an Ag uh, Center of Excellence, Ag Business Innovation Center, uh, $2 million uh, commitment uh, uh, for that purpose, and we're also seeing uh, additional resources requested in the budget to be able to expand uh, centers of excellence uh, at HBCU. So that work continues. It is somewhat dependent on our ability uh, to get uh, the 22 budget uh, through, the, through the process. Great. Thank you. So as you know, uh, many of our states where the 1890 land-grant institutions are located do not receive their one-to-one -one matching grant. We've had some issues here in my state. Uh, North Carolina. So what steps could USDA take to ensure that states provide one-to-one -one matching funds for these institutions? Uh, continue to advocacy with governors um, and making sure that they're fully aware and appreciate the opportunities in their communities, in their states, uh, from having an active and engaged HBCU, uh, the federal resources that can be leveraged. Uh, I would also say that I think it's important for us to continue to work uh, this is a little bit of field for your question, but the need for us to have a better, do a better job of connecting with, a, uh, with minority serving institutions across the board uh, to encourage more internships, fellowships, and scholarships um, so that we again create a closer connection. Uh, and the reason for this is simple. 8% of the workforce at USDA is under the age of 35. Uh, and so we're going to face a significant workforce shortage at some point in time in the near future. Uh, we've got to make sure we have the brightest and best coming to USDA. Thank you, Secretary Vilsack. That was going to be my next question about supporting Centers of Excellence in the 2023 Farm Bill, uh, based on what you said. Uh, you're in support of that. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to yield back. My time's up. The gentlelady from Missouri, Ms. Hartzler, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and it's good to see you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you for all that you do for agriculture. And I'm, I'm very excited and appreciative of what you're doing to try to promote more uh, meat processing plants uh, nearby in our rural communities. And I know that has been a focus of yours. I, I did send a letter last July asking for some clarification of what the criteria was going to be for distribution of that first $375 million for independent processors. Uh, so could you give me an, um, an update on the criteria for those monies and more specifically will processors who began operating uh, or conducted any expansions since or during uh, the beginning of COVID be able to qualify for these monies? We provided some additional resources for existing facilities to expand uh, under our uh, loan guarantee program uh, that was announced uh, uh, several weeks ago. Uh, in addition, as you mentioned, uh, the grant program is going to be broken down into two tranches. The first $150 million is going to be made available. Uh, we hope uh, the framework of that and the structure of that will be disclosed in, in the next few weeks. Uh, and it is designed primarily to jumpstart projects that are, that are ready to go, that are shovel ready. They just need a little uh, encouragement. They could be an expansion of an existing facility or they could be uh, a new construction. Uh, either one will qualify. Um, and the hope is that we get uh, 10, 15, 20 projects that are funded through that process. And then in the summer, another $225 million of grant resource and $275 million of additional low interest financing will become available. That will also be available for both existing facilities wishing to expand and for, uh, and for uh, new facilities. And the goal here, I think, is to make sure that we uh, are are addressing the wide array and range of needs uh, from very, very small processing operations to mid-sized operations. Uh, we are hopeful that we see farmer-owned cooperatives uh, take a look at the possibility of uh, accessing some of these resources uh, so that we expand capacity and obviously competition. And the belief is that when we do that, uh, producers will benefit and so will consumers. 
Sure. Well, there is some uh, entities that stood up uh, because they saw a need and they, they went in debt. And now they can't qualify because they're already up and running. They're not expanding. They started from fresh. But I would encourage you, maybe we could talk offline, to not forget those people who put everything on the line and went to the bank and, and mortgaged everything in order to stand up a plant. But now they, they don't qualify and, and just because of the timing. So anyway, I, I, I would appreciate if we could talk further about that and and we don't leave anybody out who has stood up and really tried to help in that regard. Um, there is some also recent news regarding, and it's exciting, that uh, there's a successful transplant of a heart from a genetically engineered pig into a human. And that is something, certainly an advancement that we can be um, pleased about with biotechnology. But unfortunately, it's also a stark reminder of the lack of a clear path to commercialization for animal biotechnology products intended for agriculture rather than medical purposes. For example, the University of Missouri in my district has been a leader in developing a PERS resistant uh, hogs. And because of the current process and jurisdictional mayhem between USDA and the FDA, this technology is not yet available for producers, and yet China and other countries are moving forward very rapidly to get to this point, but we already have that technology. So, Mr. Secretary, as a move closer to having a confirmed FDA commissioner, how do you plan to engage with your counterparts at HHS to finalize the work started on the advance notice of proposed rulemaking and related MOU on the genetically engineered animals? Well, uh, Congressman, woman, we actually thought we had done that work uh, with a signed MOU, but there is some indication from the FDA and uh, Department of Health and Human Services that they don't uh, believe that there was authority uh, for the fo folks who signed that on behalf of FDA. So we obviously would, uh, as soon as the FDA uh, commissioner is, is uh, confirmed, we will work very closely with that individual to make sure that there is ongoing discussions and negotiations to complete that MOU. We understand and appreciate the necessity of having clarity, and we're anxious to have that. That's good. That'd be great. Uh, Reuters reported that the Biden administration is considering lowering the, lowering the 2022 uh, ethanol blender mandate because below the proposed $15 billion gallons, uh, potentially hamstringing the biofuels industry. Are you aware of these reports, and do you agree that cutting biofuel blending would only serve hurt rural communities? The general lady's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you well, may follow up. I, I would just mention uh, that the, the, the biofuel uh, levels for 2021, 2022, are the highest in the history of the program which indicates a projective growth. And in addition, the Department of Agriculture is providing $700 million of additional assistance to the biofuel industry uh, to, uh, to encourage it uh, to get it through the pandemic situation, as well as in $100 billion to expand access to higher blends. So I think I, I can make the case uh, that this is an industry that, uh, a, a administration, that's, administration that is supporting this industry, <coughs> along with the 65, 65 waivers that were denied by the EPA that might very well have been granted uh, during the previous administration. The gentlewoman from Connecticut, Ms. Hayes, who is also the chairman of the Subcommittee on Nutrition Oversight Department Operations, is recognized now for five minutes. Good morning, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Secretary Vilsack, for being here today. The first thing I'd like to discuss is food access in rural areas through the SNAP online pilot purchasing pilot. Since the creation of the pilot program in 2019 and the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, SNAP online purchasing has expanded into 48 states and over 75 SNAP retailers. In Connecticut, SNAP recipients can buy groceries online through five different grocery stores, though none are small independent businesses. However, the eligibility to actually utilize the program is not equitable across the country. Although most states have a SNAP online purchasing retailers, the retailers do not always serve all zip codes within a state. According to a 2019 study, online purchasing and delivery services were available to only 31% of census tracts considered in rural food deserts. In comparison, online food purchasing and delivery services were available in 94% of census tracts considered urban food deserts. Secretary Vilsack, Congress has provided $30 million for the USDA to invest in SNAP online purchasing and other SNAP technological modernizations throughout the pandemic. 
How has the USDA used the funds Congress has provided to make SNAP online purchasing a reality in all rural areas? And how can Congress assist the USDA in making the programs more accessible in these areas? Well, Congresswoman, the information I have is that uh, today 97 percent of households uh, have the opportunity for online purchasing. Uh, obviously, I'll be happy to go back and check and make sure those numbers are accurate. Uh, but to the extent that there is a need for uh, a continued focus on rural and uh, remote areas, I would say a couple of things. First of all, uh, we are looking forward uh, at some point in time early in 2022 and announcing a healthy food financing initiative uh, using resources from the American Rescue Plan to begin uh, aggressively addressing the issue of food deserts. Uh, part of the issue here is not just the access to online, but also the ability of having uh, uh, facilities to basically provide uh, the food to folks. Uh, so that's one thing that we expect to do, and a focus of that effort will obviously be on rural and remote areas. Secondly, we're also making sure that we are helping food banks who also help to service those same individuals. Uh, be able to have access to resources uh, to be able to figure out ways in which they can more easily and more completely Well, it sounds, oh, are we on? I think we're on. Bravo. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me, Please, if continue. I could finish that, the last comment, and it has to do with the, the uh, role of the food banks in trying to respond to rural remote uh, new food needs. We've also provided a $100 million of what we refer to as reach and resiliency uh, resources for food banks across the country, uh, encouraging them to look for ways that they can address the need for food security in rural and remote areas and also to have the infrastructure that will allow them to store uh, fresh produce, uh, dairy products and so forth, refrigeration and storage capacity. So hopefully uh, we, we are addressing in a multitude of ways uh, the need for access to food in those rural remote areas. No. Uh, that members of the NOTO subcommittee have, worked, have been working diligently to address veteran hunger. The USDA's e Economic Research Service released a report last year finding that more than 11 percent of working age veterans lived in food insecure households and that veterans have a 7.4 percent greater risk of food insecurity than the general population. To address this deeply concerning reality, how is the USDA working with the VA to target food assistance to veterans? And how is the USDA working to ensure eligible veterans know about their eligibility to take advantage of, of, of these types of programs? We're working with uh, Veterans Affairs to make sure that as uh, individuals leave service in the Department of Defense, as they leave service, 
uh, that they are fully and completely aware of the resources that are available to them, including uh, the ability to uh, access SNAP benefits. Uh, we'll continue to work with both the VA and the Defense Department uh, to make sure that we are doing the very best job we possibly can to make sure that those resources are available. Uh, you know, this is a uh, this is a you know a sad sad state of affairs that folks are, are who have served our country uh, are in need of this kind of assistance, and we need to make sure that they get it. Thank you, Secretary Vilsack. We had a hearing in, in our subcommittee and heard from veterans, and it is tragic that this is happening here in this country, and we have a responsibility to, to do better. So I look forward to working with you to make sure that we close those gaps and support our veterans. Um, I'm coming to the end of my time, and I'll leave you with one last question that perhaps if you don't have time, you can follow up on. Between 2016 and 2020, the number of full-time employees at the USDA decreased from nearly 94,900 to approximately 86,400. Has this de decrease affected USDA's ability to communicate with states and producers about new programs and the process to participate in them? And how can Congress assist USDA in ensuring you have adequate staffing levels uh, that you need to take on the responsibilities we have tasked you with, especially as we work towards this upcoming Farm Bill? I think one of the areas where we have uh, dealt with the, the decline of workforce uh, is in the Natural Resource Conservation Service uh, and in our Forest Service and our ability to maintain. The ladies' time has expired. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Scott and Ranking Member Thompson for holding this hearing and also to my friend, Secretary Vilsack for, for coming to testify again today. It's great to see you. Um, you know, I get to ask questions a little sooner than when we first met a few years ago when you were sitting at that same table. Hey, uh, Mr. Secretary, back in November, we held a hearing on the supply chain crisis, and the consensus was that every sector is actually being crushed by this administration's rampant spending agenda that's really driving high costs and inflation. These impacts are being felt by our constituents everywhere. They see it at the empty, in the empty grocery store shelves when they pay more at the pump and at the local businesses that, as you just mentioned, uh, you know, in USDA's case, struggling to find employees. There are approximately 11 million work-ready adults certified by their state workforce agencies who are receiving SNAP benefits but could start working immediately to fill the approximately 10.6 million open jobs that we have. We've got an entire untapped workforce that could be moving products, stocking shelves, and filling jobs. But that's if we prioritize employment and training programs to train these individuals. We could immediately solve a huge piece of the puzzle in our supply chain crisis. Mr. Secretary, I know the administration has issued several funding announcements to address the supply chain crisis. But how can we get America back to work after two years of paying people to stay home? Uh, I, I had a little hard time uh, understanding the question, but I think I, I'll try to respond to it. Um, it. You know, one of the things that that we are doing is obviously individual states have the ability to make decisions concerning uh, the administration of SNAP and the and the uh, ability to uh, encourage folks who are able-bodied to get back into the workforce. Uh, some states have exercised that power. Other states are in, still in the process of deciding whether to exercise that power. So part of this is, is I think, uh, it's important for states to analyze their current circumstance and make a decision about what to do. Uh, in the meantime, I think we're, uh, you know, we're looking at ways in which we can provide help and assistance at USDA. You know, one of the areas uh, that we're concerned about, uh, frankly, is, uh, is, is the fact that there are agricultural products that are available and ready for export, uh, but for whatever reason, uh, there are empty containers that are leaving our ports because shippers are making the decision that it's less, uh, it's more profitable for them to have empty containers move back to Asia than and it is to fill them with agricultural products. So we're looking for ways in which we can utilize resources to fill those containers. Now, as we do, I think that's gonna create opportunities not only for agriculture, but potentially for, uh, for additional uh, 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 job efforts. Um, Nobody anticipated, I don't think, uh, Congressman, uh, the number of, uh, of people who made the decision, life decision, to retire. Um, this obviously is a, 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 you know, a challenge, and, and it's one that we're going to have to take a look at creatively um, uh, to try to address. Yeah, it is, it is a challenge, and, and I agree. But I also think there, there may be some ways to utilize the staff education and training program 
to get uh, our SNAP beneficiaries the training that they need to go fill jobs that are that are available to replace those who retired. Well, so we, I would urge you. We, I'm sorry. We ju we just we we just passed a uh, we, we just finished a rule on in, improving the employment and training uh, under the SNAP program, and it's important to talk about this because. Again, it's state's responsibility to take the resources that we're providing them, millions of dollars. In many cases, states don't spend those resources, um, and that's unfortunate. And in many cases, they don't do a particularly good job. They know who the SNAP beneficiaries are, and they know where the workforce needs are uh, because they have workforce development offices. And what this new rule is requiring states to do is to do a better job of marrying that information and data so that they can create the opportunities for folks uh, to, to be gainfully employed. So hopefully this new rule uh, will address some of the concerns that you're raising. Great, that's great. I'd love to continue to work with you and the agency on uh, on, on ensuring that our states do the right thing and use the programs that are there. Uh, I don't have a lot of time left, Mr. Secretary. I, I do want to make sure, you know, obviously uh, prioritizing higher blends of ethanol and biodiesel fuels, we believe are going to help reduce emissions and help lower prices at the pump. Um, I just wanted to get I just wanted to get your your response on USDA's higher blend infrastructure incentive program. Uh, it's been ex it's it's been successful at increasing the availability. Do you have any further plans to bolster the uh, the HPIIP program? Well, I think we just announced about a hundred million dollars uh, to encourage expansion of of higher blended fuels. And I would point out in the nine seconds left that there's also a tremendous opportunity in aviation fuel. Uh, the grand challenge that was recently announced uh, creates a tremendous opportunity for the biofuel industry for expansion. The Great. gentleman well, from New York, Mr. Delgado, who is chair of the subcommittee on commodities, exchanges, energy, and credit, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman Scott, for holding this hearing. Um, and I want to thank Secretary Bilsack uh, for testifying before the committee today. Secretary Vilsack, one issue I'd like to raise uh, relates to milk consumption, uh, a priority uh, that I know uh, you and I both um, share, as we've spoken about it uh, previously, including when you came to my district and met with my in-district agriculture advisory committee. Uh, Ranking Member Thompson and I have offered bipartisan legislation to allow schools to serve all varieties of milk, including whole milk. I know uh, that we're limited uh, by current law, which stipulates that milk offerings uh, in schools must align with the most recent dietary guidelines. But I'm concerned that when the guidelines were last updated in 2020, the Dietary Guideline Advisory Committee, the DGAC, didn't appear to consider some recent science that pointed toward positive or neutral effects of dairy fat. With the whole milk uh, being preferred choice, it being the preferred choice, uh, when compared to skim or low fat milk options, we know it has a clear track record for improving milk consumption. We also know that the DGAC wants to increase milk consumption. Uh, so accordingly, I, I do hope the next go round, the DGAC will at least more carefully consider the full body uh, of science. I also appreciate that when you visited my district uh, last summer, you spoke about examining ways to encourage whole milk uh, in schools, possibly even through uh, a pilot program. I would love to have you uh, if possible, elaborate uh, on what specific actions uh, your department is considering uh, and what we can do on our end to help make that happen. Well, uh, Congressman, one of the key problems with uh, the issue of whole milk is cost. Uh, if you uh, talk to uh, school nutrition folks uh, out there in the countryside, they, they operate on a very difficult and tight budget, uh, and part of the issue is cost. One thing that we can do in terms of additional consumption of milk is to take a look at ways in which the current supply of milk is, make, is being made available and whether or not it is a barrier to consumption. And I think if you, do, if you look at the research, you're going to find that the containers that are used in schools are a barrier. Uh, they're difficult uh, to open, uh, and so kids uh, oftentimes just pass on the milk. Oftentimes, the temperature of the milk is not what it needs to be. So we're looking at ways in which we can provide resources to schools to basically create a, a, a way in which the milk can be distributed uh, at a very cold temperature and in uh, uh, containers that are less uh, cumbersome uh, as a way of increasing uh, milk consumption. I would point out that while uh, milk consumption is down in this country, dairy consumption is not down. It's actually up 
We, we, uh, we may not drink as much as we used to, but we certainly eat more than we do uh, used to in terms of cheese and yogurt and things of that nature. And we've in, in, instituted those products into the, uh, into the school lunch and school uh, breakfast programs. Uh, I, I appreciate that. I do have one other question, but just as a follow-up in terms of the cost, I know you mentioned um, the manner in which the containers are presented could be helpful. Um, but is there any thought being done um, or any thought being given to the ways costs can be addressed from, from uh, the agency? Well, you all have the opportunity to, to, to make a determination and to provide the budget and resources that would enable uh, the reimbursement rate uh, and the resources available to schools could be increased uh, uh, to provide additional resources. And we're, right now, as a result of the pandemic, we're doing what we can uh, to increase uh, access to resources uh, as school districts are faced with uh, some serious challenges. And one of the reasons there's a challenge is that not only uh, f food is, uh, we're, we're changing the way in which and where we eat food, about 10% more in-home consumption today than pre-pandemic. And that's created a, a need for a shift away from supplying to restaurants versus supplying it to a grocery store, different packaging, different sized uh, 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 containers, et cetera, all of which the supply chain is working through uh, as we hopefully at some point in time return to uh, whatever the new normal is. I appreciate that. I see that I'm bumping up against uh, my five minutes, so I will um, circle back to you at a later date, but uh, I'll yield back the rest of my time. Thank you. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Allen, is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Allen, you may want to unmute. There we go. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary. We've been uh, wanting to hear from you. <clears throat> We're almost a year into this administration, and we've been wanting to hear from you, particularly now that you know, we're a nation in crisis. I mean, you go to the gas pump, you may get gas, you may not, because we know we got a war on fossil fuel. Uh, we also have, seem to have a war on agriculture. Uh, we got, to, in my district, we've got farmers trying to export uh, cotton, peanuts, uh, pecans, uh, you name it, and uh, we can't get containers uh, loaded to, uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, for whatever reason, uh, China and uh, their, their situation, containers are going back empty. So we've got just crisis after crisis after crisis on the supply chain issue, and I'm sure you're going to hear a lot more about that. One issue that is specific to my district is, as you're aware, the EPA banned the food tolerance of a critical pesticide, uh, chloropower ferrous, uh, and uh, uh, right now, EPA's decision uh, is in conflict with actually USDA has pointed out that uh, our science uh, supports the continued safe use of, uh, of this chemical. Uh, typically, in these situations, uh, USDA would go to OMB and there, there would be some kind of ruling there. Where are we with uh, the situation on this particular chemical and what are you doing about it? Uh, this is a good, good question, uh, Congressman. Uh, and I will tell you that uh, we have ongoing conversations and discussions with EPA. I don't know that we've necessarily reached a, a, a consensus, but those discussions are ongoing. Well, you know, we're, uh, we're, we're getting close to planting season here. So there's a sense of urgency as you might, uh, uh, you know, might understand. As far as uh, the, uh, you know, as, as far as the, the, the situation with the, um, uh, the, the cost of uh, food at the grocery store, I'm getting hammered with that in the district. Uh, where are we with that, and what uh, what what are you doing as far as investigative work, and what might happen to uh, to relieve some of that pressure? Well, I think there are a couple of. Re I mean, first of all, there's been a uh, in some of the areas where we've seen increased prices. Uh, the good news is there's been some deceleration in the last couple of months. Hopefully, that continues. Uh, meat, in particular, has gone down just a bit. Uh, this is basically strong demand, and as I uh, indicated earlier, strong demand globally and 
nationally, uh, and essentially we're uh, changing our patterns of how we eat and where we eat. Uh, and the supply chain is in the process of adjusting to the fact we're eating more at home and less out in restaurants. Uh, we are trying to address the issue of, of ports and, uh, by encouraging longer hours at the ports. I mentioned the efforts to try to get more drivers and trucks with apprenticeship programs and CDL licensing being issued. We've got pop-up uh, 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 ports that are being uh, encouraged uh, to create uh, movement of those containers and getting them into the stream of commerce. Uh, we're continuing to look for ways in which we can provide help and assistance to uh, families that are struggling. That's why we uh, have the SNAP program and, and the review of the Thrifty Food food program. That's why we provided additional assistance to schools in the form of additional cash as well as additional uh, food products that we're purchasing. Uh, we've got the summer EBT program and encouraging uh, states to, to, uh, to again apply for or, or to provide their plans. So there's a variety of things we're doing to try to help folks through this difficult period uh, while we're trying to balance uh, supply and demand. Uh, also, uh, recent attacks on uh, our uh, packaging industries, uh, of course, we talk, you know, you're taking action as far as the, the meat uh, industry, but our chicken folks are very concerned about uh, uh, production as far as line speeds and things like that. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, have you been in, I mean, have you been on the front lines and talked to these folks about the issues they're dealing with? Obviously, workforce. I mean, we got workforce problems in agriculture. I got about 18 seconds. Uh, tell me what you're doing there. Well, uh, we're working through uh, on the pork side uh, a federal case that basically d denied uh, our rule. Uh, we're working with nine entities, uh, nine uh, uh, businesses. Five have applied for a waiver. We're in the process of reviewing those waivers. We've created a waiver system. On the poultry side, we've asked for uh, the court to remand uh, uh, the litigation back to USDA so we can try to create a similar uh, waiver process uh, uh, in the poultry area. So we are focused on that. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush. It's recognized for five minutes. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this hearing. Secretary Nielsen, I'm so delighted that you once again are with us here today before this committee. And I want you to know that I really appreciate your continued commitment to working with me and the other members of this committee. Mr. Secretary, we really want to work with you, we really do, and I'm delighted that this feeling is mutually uh, felt. I recently mentioned to you that there's too much misunderused potential uh, agriculturally in my city of Chicago and its immediately surrounding areas. Uh, Chicago was at one time, and it still is, a hub for railroads and they connect our nation to, um, to uh, for the purposes of agriculture. It is indeed uh, a, 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 the place where there's a, a lot of vacant properties, uh, vacant land that could be used specifically for, for vertical farming. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I think that I might have shared with you then uh, for decades, Chicago was the nation's flower capital, uh, the pickle capital, uh, and uh, the um, uh, 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 and the lettuce capital uh, for our nation, uh, and, and celery capital for our nation. And I think that once again, Chicago has the potential to be uh, uh, significant in the agricultural sector. Uh, with that said, Mr. Secretary, I want to discuss the prognosis for black farmers under your leadership. As you well know, our nation's black farmers are in a desperate need of assistance. In 1920, there was almost one million black farmers, of which my grandfather was one. Uh, according uh, to uh, accounting for 14% of 
performers at that particular time. In 2017, there were less than 50,000 black farmers, making up only 1.4% of the farming population. Mr. Secretary, without action, this situation will only get worse. It was re recently reported that direct loan applications are significantly more likely to be rejected for black farmers than for white farmers. And even when approved, the loans for the uh, black farmers are far less than loans for white farmers. Moreover, black farmers are all too often still feel as though they are unwelcome in these local USDA field offices. I know that you are working hard, your department is working hard at your direction to reverse these injustices once and for all. And my question to you, Mr. Secretary, is will you please outline exactly how USDA is working to help minority farmers and particularly black farmers? Uh, Congressman, thank you very much for the question. Uh, when I saw the statistics concerning the uh, the uh, the decline rate of uh, African American farm applications, I asked the team to take a look at, uh, in depth look at, at, at the reason. Uh, and what we found was that it oftentimes, uh, in some cases, the application was withdrawn, in some cases, the application was incomplete, in some cases, the application just simply didn't have the, uh, the cash flow uh, that, made, uh, that made sense. A, a, a lot of different reasons. But I think the fundamental concern and the fundamental challenge is that f folks do not have the technical assistance to be able to understand precisely how to access USDA programs. And for that reason, under the American Rescue Plan, we are using resources to provide assistance to create cooperating groups that can connect with those African American farmers and those black farmers to provide the technical assistance, the financial planning, uh, the, the business planning, uh, the development of, of applications so that there is more success. So the first order of business here is to get folks the kind of technical assistance they need. And the USDA has expanded significantly uh, efforts in that regard, and we're going to continue to expand efforts. Um, there's a lot more I can say, but I see my time is up. <laughs> the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Rouser, is recognized now for five minutes. Well, thank you, Chairman Scott and uh, Mr. Secretary. Always good to see you. Appreciate uh, you being here today. Uh, I want to follow up on this in inflation um, aspect. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, supply and demand is a, obviously a key component, uh, but government policy, particularly bad government policy, uh, affects uh, supply and demand. Uh, lack of labor is a big issue. Uh, you know, when you pay folks not to work, that exacerbates that problem. Uh, excessive spending uh, that's not needed. Uh, you got too many dollars uh, facing too few goods. Uh, the easy money policies of the Fed, uh, your restriction of oil and natural gas development in this country, all that uh, plays a part uh, in this inflation crisis uh, that we're seeing. And, um, you know, I note that uh, the administration and, and you went after the uh, meat and poultry industry uh, pretty strong not long ago. Uh, and I know also that uh, the administration is pursuing additional GIPSA rules on these industries, which will only further drive risk, which increases cost, uh, which increases uh, inflation uh, for consumers. And uh, so I, I just uh, really push back on uh, these new GIPSA rules uh, as strongly as I possibly can. And note that multiple Congresses uh, have rejected these proposals in the past. Uh, are you still intent on moving forward with these, uh, given the uh, inflation crisis that we have in this country? Well, uh, Congressman, I, you know, I don't think the GIPSA rules are, uh, uh, are connected to inflation. Uh, I think uh, the strong demand uh, that we're seeing in a growing economy, an economy that's growing at, uh, at, at, at a record rate, uh, is, uh, is in part uh, a response. Let me just simply say about GYPSA, farmers deserve a fair shake in the marketplace, and they don't get a fair shake. They do not get a fair shake in the marketplace. Poultry producers are not, are not given a fair shake in the tournament system. It's not transparent. 
Uh, they have very little rights. Uh, they have the rug uh, pulled out from them uh, on, on multiple occasions. Uh, uh, terrible stories uh, of investments that they make only to find uh, that the, uh, the integrator basically pulls business from them. Uh, so this is about fundamental fairness. It's about giving farmers a fair shake. And you know what? That's the I think that's the department's business. That's, a, that's our role, is to make sure that we're giving farmers a fair shake, number one. Number two, it's important to expand capacity. When 85% of beef processing is in the hands of four companies, when 70% of pork processing is in the hands of four companies, when over 50% of poultry processing is in the hands of four com companies, it, it's simply too concentrated. There's not enough capacity and there's not enough competition. And frankly, if we had more competition, we'd give consumers choice. And if, if consumers have choice, I guarantee you that's also going to impact and affect price in a positive way. So well, we're going to continue to do this. Mr. Secretary, Mr. Ru uh, uh, new rules and regulations only add to uh, cost and, and drive further consolidation. It's about uh, fairness. Moving fairness. forward here, moving forward here uh, as you probably know, I hope that you know, um, Appropriations Subcommittee Chairwoman DeLauro has included a provision in the House passed fiscal year 22 approach bill to reduce line speeds in poultry plants. Uh, which all that's going to do is reduce, reduce supply. You reduce supply and you have high demand, you're driving up cost. Uh, what are we going to do about that? Well, I think it's important for us to understand that there are three uh, dynamics here. There's the need for continued uh, farmer uh, productivity and profit. There's a need for worker safety and there need, there's a need for the, the processors uh, uh, as well. And the, and the goal here is not necessarily to pit worker safety against farmer's profits or farmer profits against processor. Uh, the goal here is to try to figure out how to balance. Um, I think there is a way forward. I think we found this uh, with a pilot program that we've got in the pork industry uh, where we are encouraging uh, folks to look at, at worker safety and also to look at line speed. And I think there is a way to find a, a, a common ground here. Uh, and that is what we're going to try to do, continue to try to do at USDA. I'm encouraged by the fact that five of the nine pork producers are looking, uh, processes are looking for a line speed waiver uh, so that they can have a higher line speed, but at the same time protecting uh, the workers. And that, that seems to me to be the way we ought to approach this. Mr. Secretary, I only have about 20 seconds left. Real quickly, switching gears, uh, African swine fever, I know you're concerned about that, and, and I'm sure the department's doing everything possible to keep it out of this country. Can you provide us a quick update on that front? Uh, significant investment of time and resources in the Dominican Republic, working with them to put together a plan. Uh, Dr. Shear has spent uh, literally weeks in, Puerto, in uh, Dominican Republic. The gentleman's time has expired. And now I recognize the gentlewoman from Ohio, Ms. Brown, for Thank five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Scott and Ranking Member Thompson for holding this hearing. And thank you, Secretary Vilsack, for joining us today to review the state of the rural economy and operations of the Department of Ag. Um, as we all know too well, COVID-19 has taken a heavy toll on many of our communities and deepened the hunger crisis. USDA's Economic Research Service found that while the number of Americans who are food insecure remained level through 2020. Hunger increased for Black and Latino families and the food insecure household rate was significantly higher than the national average, 21.7% versus 10.5. Unfortunately, the pandemic's impact on hunger was felt quite inequitably. Uh, food insecurity is unconscionable, crippling reality for far too many. Americans and our communities cannot flourish when so many people, especially our students, still lack basic regular access to nutritious food. That is why I introduced the After School Meals Act. My legislation will alleviate hunger amongst the, mo amongst the most vulnerable students by enabling schools to provide healthy and nutritious meals to children in after school care. I'm also a co-lead of Congresswoman Alma Adams coming legislation that seeks to combat college hunger by providing enrolled students with access to information about SNAP benefits. So my first question is on September 16th, 2015, the federal government announced the US 2030 food loss and waste reduction goal, the first federal goal of its kind that seeks to cut food loss and waste in half by the year 2030. What is, the USA do, what is the USDA doing to advance the United States 2030 food loss and waste reduction goal? 
Uh, we are working with uh, what we refer to as champions, ex an extended group of industry leaders that are working with us to try to identify ways in which food waste can be reduced. Uh, we're working with schools, we're working with universities, we're working with the food industry, we're working with grocery stores, uh, we're working with restaurants, uh, we're working with food processing companies, all designed to find ways, creative ways, uh, to, to deal with the issue of, of uh, food waste. Uh, roughly 30% of what we grow and raise in this country is wasted, um, and it's, a, it, it's an unfortunate circumstance uh, and one in which we are very serious about reducing. Uh, we are, uh, I think, uh, looking for uh, a, a set of conferences and webinars in 2022 to raise the awareness uh, of this issue. Uh, we're going to take a look at what other countries are doing. I know that there's some innovative and creative uh, opportunities for food waste reduction uh, in, in Asian countries in particular, uh, so there's an opportunity for us to learn from that as well. Uh, portion sizes are, are critically important, uh, and we're obviously encouraging folks to especially in restaurants, to think about that and to give people choices in terms of, uh, of portion sizes. Thank you so much. Um, my second question is, as mandated by the 2018 Farm Bill in December 2021, USDA completed a report that assesses the progress of food loss and waste efforts. The report concludes that there is a lack of overall funding for these programs. Can you outline these programs for us? I'm sorry, Congresswoman, which programs? The uh, U.S. In the, in the Farm Bill, the USDA completed a report of the progress of food and lost waste effort. There is a lack of overall funding. Um, I understand. Is there? Can you can well, you outline the the issues around the funding for these programs? Well, I, I'll have a better understanding of that when we uh, utilize a portion of the American Rescue Plan uh, uh, resources to create uh, more. Um, uh, incentives and more infra more resources available for food waste efforts. Uh, one of the things that we're doing with reference to urban agriculture is expanding the compost opportunity uh, with grants, and there's a, a potential opportunity for us to significantly increase our investment in compost, which which obviously would uh, begin to address food waste. Uh, one additional way is to uh, encourage, obviously, I mentioned portion size, reduce. Uh, and, and then, of course, there's the issue of recycling as well. So uh, there's a multitude of, of strategies, and with additional resources from the American Rescue Plan, we should be able to provide additional incentives to, to advance those strategies so that people become more aware of them. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from South Dakota, Mr. Johnson, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, we've talked a lot about livestock issues uh, in the past year, sir, obviously a, a source of great interest to you and to me. I mean, the, the administration, I think, has had some uh, rhetoric suggesting a fair amount of wrongdoing or perhaps anti-competitive behavior among uh, the large four. And I just, there is so much frustration, I think, out in cattle country about these DOJ investigations or about packers and stockyards uh, activity that takes place. And we don't really get any resolution. And, and I understand there are some reasons for that. But I just wanted to pick your brain, sir. I mean, if we've got concerns about the marketplace and we announce an investigation seemingly every year and we never drive to a conclusion, does that actually benefit the marketplace at all? Your thoughts? Well, I, I think there is uh, action by the Department of Justice on a number of cases uh, uh, that are going through the process, and so you have to let them go through the process uh, before you can make a determination of whether or not they were le legitimate or not. Uh, we did ask, uh, uh, we recently announced a joint effort between the Department of Justice and USDA providing an, an area and an opportunity for people to report anti-competitive activities so that we can learn more of what's going on on the ground. In the meantime, Obviously, what we're doing at USDA is to try to focus on two, two, three things. One, creating more competition and capacity. Two, uh, creating uh, more price discovery to the extent that we can get more information on cash sales uh, and more studies to do that. We're obviously interested in that so we have a better understanding of what the market is. And three, making sure that farmers get a fair shake and that they have the ability, if they're not being treated fairly, uh, to basically raise uh, issues, and that gets to the packers and stockyards. Uh, and finally, we also want to make sure that consumers uh, get the right information in the country, in the grocery store. If there's a label on a, on a, on a, a 
ground beef, a pound of ground beef that says product of the U.S., we want to make sure that consumers understand precisely what that means. So we're in the process of doing a fairly extensive survey to find out if consumers understand what that means and, and whether they place value on it. Well, I think all that is very well said, uh, and I applaud your efforts in many of those areas, and I would agree. I mean, the current product of the USA label right now, I think it's misleading. I think, I think it provides inaccurate information to consumers. And we've had, uh, I mean, listen, I'm not going to hold you uh, fully accountable or accountable at all for uh, uh, promises the last guy made, but we have heard for years now that we were going to reform the product of the USA, and I hope you can get it done, sir, in a way that maybe others couldn't. I mean, I want to get back to these investigations, though. I mean, uh, and you're right, we need to let them run their course. But, you know, we had USDA conducted uh, an investigation. They re released some sort of an interim report long after the Holcomb fire. But it didn't really drive to ground uh, some of these accusations about anti-competitive behavior. Can we expect an update or where? what's the status of that investigation? Uh, I'll have to get back to you on that. Uh, Congressman, because I, I don't, I'm not prepared today to tell you exactly what the status of that is. Be happy to get sure. back to our staff. We'll get back to to your staff on that. Uh, I, you know, I would say that, um, you know, I th I've I've talked to uh, the Attorney General. I think he's uh, he and his team is very sincere about this. Uh, they want to make sure that uh, that the playing field is level, uh, and I think we should all be in for that. Uh, and I also want to, you mentioned price discovery, criti uh, just critically important to a functioning marketplace. And I think uh, you're, you're almost certainly aware that last month the House passed out uh, 410 vote, yes votes to 11 no votes, the cattle contract library. I think the White House has done a good job of, of calling out support for a number of different legislative proposals. Uh, are there any discussions internally with your team, sir, with the White House about uh, doing what you can to see that the cattle contract library also gets through the Senate. It would provide the much needed transparency you talked about. We're very supportive of, uh, of, of, that, of that effort and very supportive of trying to get information so people know what, what a legitimate contract is and what uh, reasonable contract provisions are. And then finally, sir, you know, we've got, uh, I know that there are concerns about confidentiality uh, with the, the data that is released currently. I think there is some belief that maybe that those confidentially, if confidentiality issues uh, are uh, stand in the way of uh, price discovery. Can there be some flexibility in those provisions going forward? Well, you got to, I mean, somebody, smart enough people ought to be able to figure this out to be able to get the kind of information you need to make sure that your market is fair while at the same time making sure that you're not going overboard. And that's the goal here. That we will certainly work towards that goal. Looking Time forward to working the with gentleman you, has Mr. Chairman, that I yield back. The gentlewoman from Maine, Ms. Pingray, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you for holding this hearing. And Secretary Vilsack, it's uh, wonderful to have you in front of us and, and great to hear your answers to uh, all of our questions today. Um, and I want to particularly commend you on uh, speaking as favorably as you did around the issues related to GYPSA, uh, the lack of fairness in the tournament system, line speeds. These are just such critically important issues to address both for our farmers um, and also the health and safety of people who work in our production facilities. So thank you for that. Um, but I'll get on to my questions. Um, you know all too well that um, Danone recently announced that they will be pulling out of the Northeast, terminating the contracts of 89 organic dairy farms in the region, including unfortunately 14 farms in Maine. So in response to this, there's been a stakeholder task force that was convened and they've submitted a list of over 30 recommendations to you last month um, to both support the farms who are losing their contracts and to ensure the long-term success of the organic dairy sector in our region, which has been so important to our dairy farms. These recommendations encompass everything from building more regional processing capacity to developing new markets, uh, addressing transportation and distribution challenges, um, a, a lot of things that could be done. So can you talk to me a little bit about the steps that the USDA is taking to evaluate and act on those recommendations? Well, uh, immediately following Danone's announcement, we uh, basically put together a meeting of uh, commissioners and secretaries of agriculture and encouraged the development of that report. Uh, and certainly pleased to see the comprehensive nature of it addressing a multitude of, of, of issues. 
issues that I, not only does the federal government have to be uh, serious about, but also state governments as well, uh, and also the dairy industry. Uh, certainly glad to see that Stonyfield has, uh, has stepped forward and uh, made a commitment to provide help and assistance, and that Danone has also extended uh, the deadline, if you will. Uh, I've seen the report. I've seen the recommendations. I asked for a meeting of our team. Uh, so that we can go through those recommendations and find out what we can uh, essentially do in terms of providing help and assistance. Um, I think we'll be able to help uh, on some of the, uh, the recommendations. I think other recommendations are probably more appropriately done at the state and local level and the industry level, but uh, we will be getting a response back to the task force in the very near future with what we think we are able to do. Uh, and the good news is I think we have some resources that we can put to bear uh, to provide help and assistance, whereas we're deeply concerned about that. And it's reflective, frankly, uh, of some other challenges that we have in other, uh, other regions of the country. Well, thank you for that. I'm pleased to hear that um, you're going to come out with some of those responses soon. And I, I do agree that some of the uh, money that's been made available to deal with the issues that um, we're dealing with in the supply chain and with farmers around the country uh, should be helpful to this. And I just want to reiterate, since I know you have made both climate change and um, the issues related to consolidation in agriculture top of mind and an important priority for the department, uh, the importance of protecting organic farms when we're thinking about uh, issues related to climate change uh, is so critically important. We do not want to lose that capacity. So um, keeping them operated, operating is, is a high, high priority for our New England delegation. Um, I also wanted to ask you about climate uh, support agriculture. I really appreciated your comments and the testimony about ensuring that the USDA's climate, smart agriculture, and forestry partnerships will be available to producers of all sides, all methods, all locations, and all types of production, which we care deeply about. So even though I know you're working out some of the details, can you help us understand how you will structure the program to ensure this commitment is met? Uh, the, the goal here, obviously, is to... Uh, and hopefully soon, to announce the framework uh, and the process, the application process. Uh, and the hope is that uh, we're able to make some decisions on applications uh, in mid-2022. Uh, uh, and again, I think we, we are structuring this in a way that uh, small-sized operators, uh, different types of operations, different production methods will be uh, respected. Different ge the ge geographic challenges will also be addressed, and so it's going to be an, a concerted effort here to try to respond to all of agriculture's need to participate uh, in this effort and to take full advantage of the resources that are available. Um, and we're going to make sure that underserved producers and underserved communities are also not forgotten in this process. Now, that's the commitment, and we're, uh, I can guarantee you that we will make sure that we're, we live up to that commitment. Great. Well, I really do appreciate the commitment. I know um, <clears throat> from dealing with so many programs, it's one of the biggest issues we hear from our region to make sure that as we implement these programs, uh, they meet the needs of our farmers. And I am out of time, but I greatly appreciate your time here. And I'll submit a couple other questions for the record. Thank you. The gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Bard, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh you and the, and the ranking member for holding this, this um, session today. And I want to congratulate the secretary for serving once again as our uh, secretary of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And I really appreciate him being here today. I will say to you, Mr. Secretary, the first part of my comments, uh, you can take a brief breather because uh, you've already answered the question. But I wanted to comment just to reinforce that. And that, that deals with the biotechnology because I really think it is going to play a major role in our ability uh, in agriculture to be able to feed the number of growing population around the world. And even last fall, uh, Representative Plaskett and I sent a bipartisan letter that was signed by 37 members of the committee to you and the FDA acting administrator, uh, Janet Woodcock, urging the administration to make progress on implementing a more efficient science and risk-based regulatory system that will allow a path to the market for animal biotechnology products. And, um, and I was really glad to hear that you are working on a MOA, a Memorandum of Understanding. And, and to emphasize the importance of biotechnology, uh, the pig's heart that Representative Hartzler mentioned was going into a human being was somewhat genetically modified to make it uh, less resistant to go on or less resistant by human bodies. So 
I, I just think that we think that the USDA needs to take a lead in developing a regulatory framework for animal biotechnology and that encourages agriculture innovation and provides access to valuable new technologies. To, and, and one of the things I'm thinking about there, uh, for example, is that uh, we have feed ingredients that we can reduce the methane uh, from cattle by 36%, but yet that has to go through an FDA uh, process rather than the USDA. So, so that part of my, my question period uh, deals with reinforcing that idea and so on. If you have comments, you're welcome to make those at this time. Uh, and then I do have a question uh, after that. So. Well, let me just respond to the feed issue that you just raised. Uh, I agree with you. I, I think we do need to modernize our regulatory process as it relates to those kinds of feed additives so that we don't treat them necessarily as pharmaceutical uh, products and having to go through a, a very extensive and very expensive process when other nations are getting the feed additive into their uh, dairy industry, for example, and allowing them to essentially uh, get a market advantage by suggesting that their dairy products, for example, are more sustainably produced. So I, I, I agree. I think we do need to have a, a modernized approach here. Thank you very much. I appreciate that answer very much. So my question now gets down to the pandemic, you know, has been tough on the entire economy, as you well know, and especially on farmers and ranchers. And, um, and so the question comes up, the uh, spot market hog production program or pandemic program. I have producers telling me that they've, they've um, had difficulty in accessing those funds and so I'm, I'm asking you what the current status is and how soon we think we can get that kind of support to our pork producers. Well, we, we published the notice of funding availability uh, in December, December 14th. Uh, we created a sign-up period from uh, December 15th to February 25th. So we're obviously, uh, we are, uh, we, we initially set it up as we uh, set it up, uh, we realized that there were some issues relative uh, to the eligibility uh, requirements that created some, some challenges. So we're in the process of revising uh, our application process. We hope to get that done very soon. And, and the expectation is once we do, uh, we hope to be able to see uh, payments made sometime in, in and hopefully March, uh, the March timeframe. Well, thank you. We really appreciate that effort and want to reemphasize uh, how important it is to some of the pork producers and the problems they've endured during this pandemic. So thank you very much and thank you very much for being here. I yield back. The gentlewoman from New Hampshire, Ms. Custer, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to Secretary Bill Sock. Great to be with you. We appreciate you being here today. For nearly two years, our country's been grappling with the COVID-19 pandemic, not only the staggering death toll that it's caused, but also the devastating impact that it's had on our economy. In rural communities, hospitals, and healthcare centers in my district and across this country have been pushed to the brink. Farmers and producers have faced numerous supply chain challenges, and many families have struggled to work and learn from home with insufficient broadband connectivity. The good news is provisions in the American Rescue Plan and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Package, as well as the widespread availability of vaccines and booster shots, are starting to make a tremendous difference. But as the Omicron variant continues to rage, there's no doubt we still have a long way to go toward recovery. Mr. Secretary, there's no lack of ground to cover, so let's dive right in. Last May, I joined 49 other Democratic members in signing a letter to you calling for USDA to dedicate $300 million in relief funding for one-on-one -on -one business technical assistance for farms and food businesses. Business technical assistance includes customized coaching for business and marketing, planning, financial and labor management, and succession planning. These skills are essential to the success of small and mid-sized farms like those in my district and their long-term viability. 
the administration seems to have focused technical assistance on the middle of the supply chain, on underserved communities, and on USDO programming. All of this is important, but there's a much broader need for business technical assistance for farm and food businesses across the nation. Can you share your progress on this request to my colleagues uh, that my colleagues and I submitted to you? Well, we are in the process of, of expanding uh, our efforts in terms of the cooperators. I mentioned earlier, uh, we provided $75 million uh, to 20, uh, 20 uh, entities to basically provide additional assistance and help. We expect and anticipate that there's going to be another request for application that will expand that number significantly and expand the reach of our collaborative efforts uh, significantly. So hopefully that will be in part uh, responding to the concern that you have. Uh, we're also going to. Um, I'm just going to keep moving along, if you don't mind. Uh, we'll look forward to those results. I know it's a very successful program. I also wanted to talk with you about how we can continue to decarbonize the agricultural sector, recognizing farmers for the steps they've already target taken, and incentivizing further progress. Your building blocks for climate smart agriculture report found that on-farm renewable energy technologies and improved energy efficiency offer the biggest opportunity for reducing greenhouse gases. I agree, but I've heard from constituents that the ceiling for the Rural Energy for America program REAP needs to be higher and we need to prioritize small farm projects. With that in mind, how can USDA and its partners in the federal government help expand on-farm renewable energy use? Well, we'd certainly like to see more resources in the REAP program. Uh, you know, I, I, it'd be interesting to take a look at the data in terms of who's benefited from REAP. I think you're going to find that several thousand uh, of those grants went to small uh, and mid-sized farming operations uh, to embrace uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency. Uh, we're going to continue to work, um, and obviously uh, the passage of a budget uh, would be helpful uh, because then we'd have a, a, a certain amount of funding that we could be uh, sort of assured uh, of getting and resources and personnel to be able to uh, appropriately uh, administer those programs. I think the Climate Smart Agriculture and Forestry Partnership Initiative is also an opportunity as well. Uh, for significant uh, pilots and demonstration projects uh, to, to uh, lift up uh, the decarbonization effort. So I think there are a multitude of ways in which we can provide help and assistance. Great. And in my final minutes here, moments, shifting gears to dairy, in just a couple of months, schools will start contracting for their milk supplies for the upcoming school year 2022-2023. There's a long-running discussion about whether schools should be able to offer low-fat flavored milk. Congress has been passing year-to-year -year riders and appropriations bill to allow low-fat flavored milk, but schools really need the predictability and certainty of knowing what the rules are going to be. I understand your department has submitted a rule to OMB that covers the next school year, two school years, which is much appreciated. Could you commit to quickly finalizing regulations that provide schools with the certainty that they need? Yeah. General Lady, yeah. time has expired, but Mr. Just Secretary, you may answer. Yes. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Balderson, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Secretary Vilsack, uh, for taking time today to come to the committee. So many people in my district across Ohio and throughout rural America still don't have reliable broadband access. I think we all can agree here that what matters most is making sure that we get to a point where every American is connected. That being said, my primary concern is that USDA is not using the funds at its disposal efficiently and in a targeted manner. Last week, Lisa Hone, an expert on the broadband policy at the White House, briefed administration staff in rural stakeholders saying that the USDA's ReConnect program is focusing on very rural areas. ReConnect was created to target those areas and for the most part, it always has. However, this assurance from Ms. Hone seems to be at odds with USDA's recent changes to the program. In ReConnect Round 3, the definition, definition of underserved was changed from 25 megabytes per second download speeds and 3 megabytes bits per second upload speeds to 100 down, 20 up. 
Sorry for the confusing numbers there. This was done solely at the discretion of the USDA. This not only brings up overbuilding concerns for areas that already have access to 25 down, three up, but also concerns that the USDA will be spending more money upgrading networks in areas where people already had at least have some sort of high speed broadband service rather than in very rural areas where many households completely lack broadband. To me, it looks like USDA purposely made round three less targeted towards these very rural households. Can you explain why this change was made and how are you making sure that the third round reconnect funding will be continued to target households that have no internet access rather than overbuilding private capital or upgrading networks that already exist? Thank you. Uh, the reason for doing this is because we learned from the pandemic that, that 25.3 isn't sufficient when you're dealing with distance learning, telemedicine, expanded access to a market uh, for small business, precision agriculture on the farm. There is a need for additional capacity, uh, which we learned during the course of the pandemic. So it's equipping uh, rural America to basically have the kind of broadband access that is meaningful and that actually can make a difference. At the same time, the structure of the program does in fact prioritize 25-3. So to your point, uh, I think there are additional points for rural remote areas, there are additional points for, uh, for, the, the, uh, for cooperatives and, and nonprofits basically applying for these resources. So the structure of the program I think will result in uh, a, a, a significant improvement of access to meaningful broadband and at the same time providing resources to those unserved and underserved areas that you're concerned about uh, because of the way the, the point system is structured. Okay, thank you very much for the answer. Uh, my next question, uh, Mr. Secretary, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act redefined eligible service areas for the ReConnect program from 90% of households underserved to 50%, effectively reducing how targeted the program is towards very rural areas. To that end, are you concerned this reduced threshold will cause ReConnect to be less targeted and create overbuilding of broadband networks in areas that are already receiving funds from other federal broadband programs. I no. follow up to that. Would be what? Go ahead, sir. I'm not, because I think the, the, the way in which you can structure uh, the, the point system that's used to evaluate applications can allow you to, to ensure that you're directing the program where it's needed most, and also to the fact that there was, uh, as well, uh, a waiver of, of the match requirement, which I, su I suspect uh, will also encourage and uh, will see applications from areas that have been historically underserved. So I, I, I'm not as concerned uh, about the lowering of that threshold as, uh, as, as you might be. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Chairman, I yield back my remaining time. The gentleman from Illinois. General Lady, I'm sorry, Ms. Bustos, who is also chair of the Subcommittee on General Farm Commodities and Risk Management for five minutes. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Secretary, great to see you. And uh, let me start out by just saying thank you so much for taking the time just late last year when you came to our congressional district, visited Arsenal Island uh, between your home state and mine. And uh, we had an opportunity to host you at our Lock and Dam there, which is uh, Lock and Dam 15. And uh, we took a little time that day to talk about the importance of inland waterway infrastructure. And then just yesterday, um, I think the Biden administration can take a, a victory lap, as can you, with the announcement that we have $829 million that are flowing through the Navigation and Ecosystem Sustainability Program, which we call NESP. Um, that will be used to modernize the locks and dams along the upper Mississippi River. Um, if you could take just a, a little bit of time to talk about the impact that modernizing our inland waterways like those on the upper Mississippi River will have on the rural agric agricultural economy. Well, that was a great trip and I appreciate you uh, arranging it. I learned uh, during that course that 
we can cut in literally in half the time it takes for a barge uh, with uh, soybeans to travel the Mississippi River by improving the lock and dam system. What does that mean? It means that we get those, uh, that product to port uh, more quickly, less expensively, and as a result, we can price that product for export uh, at a very competitive price. When 30 percent of what we grow and raise is exported, our ability to compete uh, in a very competitive circumstance for agricultural exports is absolutely directly connected to our uh, advantage of our transportation system. Uh, and because of the, uh, invest the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, we'll now be in a position to continue to maintain that competitive edge and advantage. And I think that allows us to be confident that we're going to continue to do uh, a lot in exports. I'm pleased that we had a record year in agricultural exports last year, and that's one of the reasons why farm income is up. Uh, and we expect and anticipate that we're going to surpass that record this year. Uh, but long term, our ability to maintain that competitive edge is directly connected to those improvements. And so uh, it, it is a very big deal for American agriculture that those resources are going to go to improve the lock and dam systems. I agree. We could not have been more excited with, with this announcement. And we are so grateful to you and to the, the, the whole Biden administration for seeing that this investment is so important, especially in the upper Mississippi. Um, you talked a little bit earlier uh, with uh, Congresswoman uh, Hartzler's questions about uh, the EPA releasing new um, renewable volume obligations. Uh, and, and so I want to drill down just a little bit deeper there. Um, you know, it, it sets standards for how much renewable fuel like ethanol, so important to a region like the one I represent, and how that will be required to be blended with gasoline going forth. I was very, very happy to see that the 2022 renewable fuel standard was, was set at what we would consider back on track as uh, President Biden promised with a, with a $15 billion, or I'm sorry, $15 billion gallon mandate. Um, can you talk, Mr. Secretary, a little bit uh, to the importance of this higher number for our family farmers in, in rural America? Well, it, it, it's an industry that does three things. One, it supports stability and in farm income. Uh, for those who are producing corn and, and for biodiesel soy, uh, soybeans. It, it, incurs, it increases job opportunities in rural areas, uh, and it provides consumers choice and less expensive gas. Uh, and it's also beneficial to the environment. So there are actually there are four benefits to this industry. Uh, that's why it's important in the industry to have stability. And the stability comes not just in setting a number, but in making sure that that number is real. And when you have waivers, as was granted in the previous administration, that number that was given by the previous administration was never real because you were seeing it uh, dissipated by, by the granting of waivers. This EPA basically said 65 waivers, not going to grant them, not going to approve them. The number we're giving you is a real number, and you can count on it. And I think the, the stability is going to be very helpful to this industry. Yeah, those waivers, uh, we like to characterize it uh, as giving out uh, candy on Halloween. They were just given out so indiscriminately and so harmful to those who are in the ethanol business. So thank you for getting that back on track. Um, I had one more question. I'll go ahead and hold off on that uh, in, uh, in honor of the, the time that we have left. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Secretary. We, again, we really appreciate you being here. And Mr. Chair, I'll yield back the 22 seconds I have left. Thank you. <laughs> the gentlewoman from Washington, Ms. Schreier is recognized for five minutes. Ms. Schreier, you may want to unmute. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and welcome back, Mr. Secretary. I, I want to mostly focus on the state of uh, the tree fruit industry today. Um, as you know, Washington State is the nation's top producing state for apples, pears, and cherries, many of which are grown in, in my district, the 8th Congressional District. <clears throat> and I have heard from a lot of growers in my district lately about really the precarious state of the industry right now. Um, trade wars and the resulting retaliatory tariffs in India and China continue to harm Washington apple growers uh, who export about a third of their crop. For example, uh, India, uh, was a $120 million market for Washington. And last year that fell 83% to just, <clears throat> excuse me, $20 million. So growers really risk permanently losing access to these markets uh, if our trade partners move. So I guess my first just request, it's not even a question for you, is just to continue to work on supply chains and for, on trade so that they can keep these export markets. 
Um, also, growers in my district uh, know firsthand the challenges of navigating climate change and they had record heat this last summer. And tree fruit is a perennial crop. So trees always sequester carbon and tillage is not an issue after initial planting. And um, cover crops, you can't always use them, uh, particularly with cherry trees because they can spread little cherry disease. And so a lot of the traditional climate friendly practices, they just don't apply uh, to orchards. And so while orchardists in my district would love to participate and really take advantage of these climate friendly, climate supportive programs, current policy discussions focused on carbon markets and conservation programs um, may fall short of what's needed to really help them adopt uh, fairly costly practices that will further, further reduce the industry's carbon footprint. So um, my, my first question, Secretary Vilsack, is just um, it, it, as you're thinking about different types of farms and having the farmers at the table, um, what, what specific steps is USDA taking to ensure that perennial crops, orchards, um, are not left behind in these efforts? In the Climate Smart Agriculture and Forestry uh, initiative that, we've, uh, uh, that we're working on, we're essentially reaching out to producers of all types and basically saying, come to us with a pilot, come to us with a demonstration project that you believe will make an impact in terms of the industry and in terms of climate, and let us figure out how we can help finance that activity on the farm with a large enough group of farmers that we can get data and information that would allow us to create that, uh, that climate smart commodity I referred to earlier. Uh, so there's nothing, to res there's nothing restricting the ability of, uh, of, of the, the tree fruit industry from coming together with a, a program or a, that is specifically designed to meet their needs to, to do what they can do in, in terms of a, a carbon footprint uh, and come to us uh, with an application for resources to be able to fund that. And then we would partner with a land grant university uh, or other entity that would allow us to collect the data and the information that would establish the standards so that when they begin to export or when they begin to sell domestically, they're in a position to be able to say to their customer, uh, this is a sustainably produced product and here's the proof and the reason for it. Um, I so I would encourage them to apply. If you wouldn't mind, I'd love to just highlight uh, supply chain. I talked about getting our goods overseas, but I was just at Cranick Dairy and Enumclaw in my district, and they're actually having a lot of trouble getting penicillin and other medications to treat mastitis in their cows. And so I wanted to point out the supply chain in the other direction and having a diversified source for things like the medications that dairy farmers need for their cows. And then um, I have um, just a few seconds remaining, but I, I wanted to note, I've heard a lot from my colleagues about the lack of, um, of people in jobs and um, attributing blame. And I'll tell you that I've spent a lot of time with the business community and the farming community, and I have heard loud and clear from both that we need to take a look at our immigration policy and that they attribute a lot of their inability to find workers uh, to the lack of immigration. So thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. I yield back. I couldn't agree more on the immigration issue. Fix the system. The gentleman from uh, Iowa, Mr. Frenstra, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Scott, Ranking Member Thompson, and uh, thank you, uh, Secretary Vilsack. It's always great to see an Iowan in your position. Uh, just got a couple questions. Earlier this month, the USDA announced its action plan for a fairer, more competitive meat supply chain. Of, core, of the four core strategies, the action plan includes increasing transparency in the cattle market. Mr. Secretary, can you expound on this core strategy and what we may ex uh, expect from the administration? Well, I, I think it has to do, as you well know, uh, with transparency, more transparency in terms of the market itself. Uh, we have too few cash uh, transactions in the market, so it's very difficult to determine when you have a cash transaction whether you're getting a fair price or not. So to the extent that we can get more data, more transparency, that's incredibly important. The other aspect of transparency is when there is a contracting relationship between a producer uh, and a processor, uh, that there is a, a, a very specific understanding of exactly what this agreement calls for. Uh, and, and what it what it requires. And that's one of the reasons why we're looking at ways in which we can create more transparency in contracting terms so that people understand and appreciate what's a fair contract and what may not be quite fair to the producer. 
Good. I'm glad to hear that. I'd love to work with you on that. Uh, pivoting to broadband, I have a question about reconnect the reconnect program. As you know, Iowa has the, the most community-based broadband providers of any state in the country, and they have been working tirelessly tirelessly to ensure Iowa has a robust fiber broadband connection. However, it's my understanding that the scoring criteria for the third round of reconnect program puts the providers at a 15 point disadvantage on grant applications because their companies aren't local governments, nonprofits, and cooperatives. I, I find that uh, really concerning. Mr. Secretary, uh, these are local family owned uh, commercial companies that are providing a service to rural Iowa. Uh, will, will you, uh, based on your track record and serving rural Americans, will you look into this concern and consider revising this uh, new policy at uh, our uh, U.S.? I, I'm happy to look into it, Congressman, but I would say that there are a number of criteria here uh, that would potentially play to the advantage of, uh, of uh, the companies you've mentioned, the rural location of the company, uh, the economic need of a particular area of Iowa, uh, the fact that affordable service, the, the price that's being paid, uh, the opportunity to serve vulnerable populations with the senior population in Iowa being uh, fairly significant. So I think there are ways to offset what you may perceive to be a disadvantage with one criteria with advantages uh, that play to the strengths thank, of Iowa with the other criteria. Thank you, Secretary. I, I would just simply say this, is that you have uh, private sector companies now competing with government, and I think that's very wrong. I mean, uh, these private sector companies want to do a great job, and yet uh, they're getting pushed out by, by government. C Congressman, uh, yeah, well, well, wait a minute. What about cooperatives? Non I mean, well, RECs, you're gonna, you, you don't want us to do and, and business with them? do play a part. I, I tend to agree. Uh, quick question for you. Uh, uh, two months ago, the FSIS announced a trial program for a new swine inspection system, the NSIS pork processing facilities to increase their line speeds. Uh, why has uh, FSIS not approved any applications yet? Uh, the longer FSIS waits, the more harm uh, is, is caused to industry. Can you expound on that? Uh, it, they're in the process of making sure that uh, working with our partners at OSHA that the worker uh, safety requirements of the waiver are, are valid and strong enough and that there is a, a way of, uh, of providing appropriate oversight because we want that balance, as I said earlier, between worker safety, the ability to process a, a number of hogs, and the profit for, for producers. I don't think we should have to pit one against the other. I think we have to figure out a way to have all three. And I think th this waiver process pr allows all three to take place. And so I'm encouraged that uh, we're going to see progress there. Okay. Uh, just pivoting to trade a minute, uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, what is USDA doing to encourage the pursuit of new trade negotiations, particularly across uh, Asia, and to remove trade barriers in the U.S.? Uh, currently, we do not have an undersecretary, and I'm just wondering twofold, what are we doing in Asia, and, and are we going to hire an undersecretary of trade? There is an individual that's going through the vetting process right now, uh, and uh, I'm hopeful that that uh, concludes very soon. In the meantime, we have a crack team uh, that is working and operating on trade. We've had some progress and so, some efforts here. Uh, mention was made to the dairy industry and the Canadian uh, decision, India opening up uh, uh, pork opportunities, Vietnam reducing their tariffs. We're trying to reestablish trust within trade and for trade and about trade in America. I think there are a lot of folks out there that feel that trade has disadvantaged to the United States. Uh, we're beginning to build trust by focusing on enforcement of any trade agreement. That's why we're putting pressure on China uh, to live up to its phase one trade agreements as well. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentlewoman from the U.S. Virgin Islands, Ms. Plaskett, who is also chair of the Subcommittee on Biotechnology, Horticulture, and Research, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, providing this venue for us to have discussion with the Secretary of Agriculture. I believe that this is so timely as we move into hearings regarding the Farm Bill. And thank you to uh, Mr. Secretary for your support of farmers, ranchers, and food systems in the United States. I wanted to ask you, you have mentioned quite often in your um, discussion, in your testimony, three phrases that you have discussed, rigid, cons um, consolidated, and fragile. Of course, we understand the fragile uh, portion of that, and you've also given us some highlights about the consolidation that's occurring with big business. 
But could you elaborate a little just for my own edification? I was really intrigued by those three words um, and descriptions of the agriculture department that you met, what you meant by rigid. Well, there's a, and I mentioned earlier that there's a, a, a shift in consumption patterns in the United States uh, post-pandemic. Uh, Pre-pandemic, 50% of our food was consumed outside the home, 50% uh, in the home. Um, and we actually have now seen about a 60-40 split between 40% restaurants, 60% uh, at home. The rigid nature uh, of packaging, uh, of the way in which the food processing industry had basically uh, gotten comfortable with that ratio, gotten comfortable with the supply chains that fed that ratio, now a bit of disruption. The same thing is happening also on, 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 on schools, where individual companies that were distributing uh, to schools for whatever reason believe there's better opportunity someplace else, and now they are beginning to shift. Uh, and that shift has created uh, a, a, deal, a great deal of frustration and stress on the part of nutrition uh, officials at schools. So it's the rigidity, the ability to, to, to transition from one consumption pattern to another consumption pattern is it, it's not easy. The transition has not been easy, and that's the reason why we have some of the challenges we have today. We're going to work through them. Thank you. Uh, we're going to try to provide more more uh, flexibility in our system, and and Thank part you. of that, Thank I'm sorry, please. part of it is is having a local and regional food system that complements that more rigid national distribution system. A complementary system is necessary. Thank you. I um, wanted to move on to the micro grants for food security programs in U.S. territories. As you heard, I represent the Virgin Islands. And of course, you're aware that uh, the non-contiguous United States, that is U.S. territories, along with Hawaii and Alaska, uh, have been provided through the Agricultural Improvement Act of 2018, a new program to provide micro grants through small-scale gardening, herding, and livestock operations. Can you speak to the success of this program as we approach the next Farm Bill? Um, has the program been successful at reducing food insecurity and developing local food systems in these communities? Is there an increase in authorization amount, currently at 10 million across all 10 eligible jurisdictions warranted as we consider the next Farm Bill? I think anything and everything we can do to create uh, the capacity of local and regional food systems to be structured and created is beneficial. Uh, it's beneficial in terms of addressing food insecurity and nutrition insecurity. It's beneficial in terms of job creation. It's beneficial in terms of, of communities, a, a sense of community, and a connection that people have with their food supply and an appreciation for those who produce it. Uh, so anything we can do to help create that structure, because in addition, by doing it, you create a much more resilient and less rigid food system that we have in the country today. Now, so, that's the intent of the program, but um, if you could have your staff get back to me as to whether or not they've seen any quantifiable difference in the food security and issues that those territories have, I'd appreciate it. And in my last remaining time, um, the renewable energy in the Virgin Islands of Puerto Rico. As you know, the viability and sustainability of energy in the U.S. Uh, Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico is the utmost importance for the well-being of our rural communities. Uh, so much of our area is, in fact, rural. Energy costs in our islands are higher than anywhere in the country, and our geographic locations leave us vulnerable to climate change, but also provide opportunities for adaption of innovation in resources. Um, Congressman Ted Lieu and I have introduced the renewable energy for those, ter those islands to create a small new grant program within the Agriculture Department in which grants may be awarded to nonprofits to facilitate projects. Can you provide any perspective on the snow soundness of a small The lady's time has expired, however, uh, Mrs. Well, Secretary, I, I, you I, may I'll, respond. I'll have our staff reach back out to the Congresswoman staff to... Uh, provide any additional information in response to that question. The general lady from Thank Illinois, so much, Ms. Miller, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, a consistent concern from my fellow farmers has to do with the skyrocketing costs of critical inputs like fertilizer. We've seen a dramatic growth in fertilizer prices. Nitrogen fertilizer has doubled in price. Anhydrous rose 131% and 
and potash is up 120%. Fertilizer is an essential input for farmers. Without fertilizer, crop yields and productivity would be significantly reduced. My constituents don't wanna see yield loss at a time when commodity prices are high. Would you please tell me what the USA, USDA is doing to address these issues that threaten farmers, especially small family farms? Well, it, it's a challenge because of the nature of what's causing this uh, disruption. Part of it has to do with global demand. Part of it has to do with decisions made by other countries uh, to prevent uh, resources from coming to the U.S. I think first and foremost, we need to expand our own capacity. Secondly, we need to make sure that we're using fertilizer appropriately and wisely. Uh, I was in recently at Iowa State University where uh, producers, uh, farmers were working with uh, the university and with a sensor program, they have determined that potentially 30% of the corn acres currently uh, in uh, Iowa that are utilizing fertilizer probably don't need as much or any fertilizer. So I think encouraging additional precision agriculture so that our inputs are wisely done. And finally, uh, figuring out ways in which we can uh, cr create uh, uh, vehicles that, in that will compensate farmers if in fact they, they decide to apply less. So we have this split nitrogen uh, crop insurance program now that essentially says if you only apply nitrogen once during the year as opposed to twice, if you have a crop a reduction, uh, then there's crop insurance that can protect you against that reduction. So I think there are a multitude of strategies here uh, to try to address the, the, the longer term issue. Uh, in, in the short term, I think we're going to try to focus on precision agriculture and making sure that we use what resources we have wisely. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I can tell you that time is of the essence here, and we do need to address the root causes of the supply chain crisis and the energy crisis created by the Biden administration. Mr. Secretary, my constituents are also concerned the Biden administration is turning its back on farmers and the biofuels industry. After pushing the Green New Deal policies that promote electric vehicles with batteries made in China, I'm concerned that President Biden is not supporting renewable fuels like ethanol. So my question for you is, will you commit to supporting biofuels like ethanol, which are crucial to corn growers in rural America? Congressman, I don't have to commit. We are doing that. And the reality is I've got 800 million reasons why we're doing that. $800 million provided the biofuel industry in terms of support during the pandemic, as well as $100 million to expand access to higher blends, uh, the ability to have consumers have access to higher blends. Uh, 65 waivers that might have been granted in the Trump administration that were denied by the CPA, a record amount uh, of uh, uh, volume for 2022 under the RFS, the grand challenge in aviation fuel to create a $36 billion gallon industry of 100% drop in it. a biofuel for our aviation industry has been launched by this administration. So I think it is very unfair to suggest that this administration has not been supportive of the biofuel industry. Well, the Biden administration's effort to push electric vehicles with batteries made in China is extremely concerning to me and my constituents. Well, Mr. Sir. Secretary, I recently introduced a bill, the National Security Moratorium on Foreign Purchases of U.S. Land Act, which would prohibit China and other adversarial nations from buying American farmland. Right now, there are over 500,000 acres of farmland in, the, in Illinois, totaling 4.1 billion that are foreign owned. This is a substantial national security and economic issue for our nation. Could you please tell me your position on the Chinese Communist Party buying U.S. farmland? Well, I'm happy to take a look at what you're proposing, and I also know that there are many state statutes that prevent foreign ownership of, uh, of land. Obviously, uh, my goal here in the United States is to make sure that we make land access available to our own citizens and that our uh, own citizens are able to afford and purchase land uh, we have a fairly significant issue in terms of land access for a lot of farmers, and we want to make sure we address that issue uh, in a they, very positive China way. Seeking to disrupt, excuse me, China is seeking to disrupt our food supply and prolong the supply chain crisis we are facing. So are you saying you're going to commit to doing everything in your power to prevent adversarial nations from dominating our supply chain? The latest time has expired. However, Mr. Secretary, 
you can briefly answer. Sure. Uh, uh, it, obviously, we're going to make sure that we're going to protect uh, 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 Americans' capacity to own farmland. We're also going to make sure that we continue to figure out ways to walk the fine line with our, our uh, uh, with folks in China, uh, given the fact that they are our number one customer for agricultural products. We, we, uh, the exports to China, when they were disrupted during the Trump trade war, caused significant decline in commodity prices. We've seen better commodity prices in the last year, which is a good news for farmers. Mm -hmm. The Thank gentleman you. from California, Mr. Kana, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Scott. Uh, thank you, Secretary Vilsack, uh, for your leadership. Uh, I have uh, said to the White House and to uh, many of my colleagues that I believe there's no one uh, frankly, in our party or our country who cares more uh, or knows more about rural America, and your voice is uh, sorely needed in many of uh, our current debates in Congress. Uh, let me ask you this. Uh, administration after administration comes and says we're going to get uh, high-speed internet to rural America. It seems like we actually finally have done something about it, passing the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Could you talk about what that means and USDA's role and how you see this being transformational uh, in actually getting high-speed internet to places that don't have them? Well, Congressman, I think you're absolutely right. The, the infrastructure bill basically provided this a significant amount of resources for the expansion of broadband uh, and meaningful broadband access. And so our focus at USDA is on meaningful uh, access. Why is that important? Well, it's important to farmers because they're going to continue to embrace precision agriculture. Every acre of ground is going to be analyzed. Data is going to be collected. You need high-speed internet to do that. Uh, schools have learned during the pandemic of the importance of remote learning and expanded distance learning. That requires broadband. Uh, the medical community has absolutely uh, determined the need for telemedicine. Uh, I've been to clinics, I've been to hospitals who absolutely need these in rural areas to be able to access expert assistance and help uh, for their patients. That requires uh, rural broadband. Small business wants to expand their market opportunities beyond maybe the community that they are located in to the world. That requires high-speed broadband access. And so there are multiple reasons why this is incredibly important. For, for rural America. We cannot let rural America be left behind here. I think with the resources that you all have provided, with the Department of Commerce, the FCC, and us, that we're going to be committed to making sure that these resources are put to use uh, and so that uh, folks, regardless of where they live, regardless of their zip code, have access to this important technology. That's wonderful to hear. Could you also talk a little bit, I know that you had a question about biofuels, and I, I know you've long championed a vision of biomanufacturing. And uh, all of the prospect that that uh, it can mean for jobs in, uh, in rural communities and uh, in states across the Midwest. Could you speak a little bit about what uh, the Department of Agriculture is doing and what more Congress can do to support biomanufacturing? One of the most important appropriations in that infrastructure bill, which is a really, really small amount in the scheme of things, might have a profound impact on rural America, which is the money that you provided to the Department of Agriculture to look at this issue of bio-based manufacturing. What is that? It's basically the conversion of agricultural waste into a variety of products. Uh, the ability uh, to, uh, to, to convert agricultural waste not just into fuel, but also into chemicals and materials and fabrics and fibers and energy, uh, all of which creates that circular economy, creates uh, new income sources for farmers, it creates the ability to avoid some of the environmental challenges that we have with some of our industries. Uh, I think there is a day when, when the issue of lagoons will be something that we talk about as having been in the past. Those, that manure can be converted into a multitude of products. Processing, manufacturing jobs can be created in rural places. Uh, additional income for farmers, more jobs, good paying jobs in rural areas, reviving the rural economy and creating a circular economy and reducing the environmental impact of agriculture and industry. Uh, it's an unlimited potential here and rural America is ripe for this opportunity and those resources, albeit small, I think can create the template for how communities might be and states might be willing to embrace this and the farm policy might be able to encourage it. Thank you. My final question for you, Secretary Vilsack, is not as much in your role as secretary, but as someone who's dedicated your life to public service in the country. You've seen firsthand how divided we are in this country 
uh, along party lines, uh, between rural communities and urban centers. It's no secret uh, that one party is winning in one area, other parties doing better in other areas. How do you think we can start to overcome some of the divides in this country and do what President Biden had aspired to do and start to heal this country and bring it together? It's a really profound question, and I wish I had a simple and profound answer, uh, but I think it is community. I think it is understanding uh, that the challenges we face as a country cannot be decided by a single individual or a single group. The challenges are so large, it requires a committed, united, communal effort. Uh, and that's why it's uh, unfortunate to see the division that's making it harder to do that. The gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Bacon, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm sorry for having to step out for votes. So I missed a few of these uh, questions. And Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here. Okay, my first question uh, deals with the foot and mouth disease vaccine bank. I was uh, the lead advocate for that in the 115th Congress. We were able to get in the farm bill. We were given a, approximately a three year a timeline uh, to make it operational. So I'd love to have your update on how we're doing with the foot and mouth disease vaccine bank, and I hopefully you have good news. Uh, significant progress. Uh, over $27 million has been invested, and in, uh, we will continue to, to provide investments into uh, that Im very, very important vaccine. And I would say that that's not the only important vaccine that we're working on. We're also working on a vaccine for African swine fever. Those two vaccines uh, are incredibly important and in, in able to protect our, our livestock industry. So three years ago, we wouldn't have been able to respond well to a foot mouth uh, disease outbreak. Would you say that we are today that we'd be able to respond with, with the addition of this uh, vaccine bank? I think we are in better shape today than we were a year ago. I think we're in better shape than we were two years ago. Uh, the reality is we know, I think we'll be in better shape next year than we are today. Okay, no, thank you. Uh, as you mentioned, the uh, African swine fever, I, heard, I read a report that there's uh, indications of African, African swine fever in Europe uh, this past week. Uh, how, are, how are we making, where are we at with our vaccine development? Do you think we're 50% there, 60? I mean, hopefully we're, I know it's a more complicated uh, disease, but it, obviously it would be a problem if it ever gets here. Well, there are uh, four or five patented uh, vaccines that have been developed at ARS facilities, uh, and there are a couple of vaccines, I think, that are incredibly promising. I believe that there's some consideration to the possibility of having some pilots uh, in some Asian countries that have been suffering from African swine fever to determine the, the effectiveness of these vaccines. I think we've made progress. Uh, I, having said that, uh, the reality is we haven't figured it out yet. Uh, we haven't solved it yet. And so we have to make sure it doesn't get into this country. And so as a result of the Haitian and Dominican Republic situation, we are aggressively promoting activities down in that part of the world uh, to basically contain uh, the, the situation and hopefully over time correct it, uh, making sure that uh, we do everything we can in Puerto Rico and else uh, to prevent anything from coming into the mainland working with customs to make sure the right questions are being asked at the border, uh, uh, increasing communication uh, in Puerto Rico in areas where uh, there may be potential uh, uh, issues in terms of uh, folks coming in uh, to the mainland from those areas, uh, making sure they're, they're sensitive to all this. So we're doing everything we possibly can under the circumstances to try to address this as aggressively as we can, but it's not easy. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And I want to transition to trade, if I may. You know, Nebraska is an export state, much like Iowa. And we didn't really hear much from President Biden until about November or from the uh, the administration on trade. We're starting to hear a little more, but I sure hope it's a priority uh, for this administration. Uh, obviously, it's, it's huge for the Midwest, corn, soybeans, pork, beef. It's it's our bread and butter, really, for, uh, you know, financially or in our economic uh health of, of both of our states there. So I just wanted your assurance that the administration is pushing trade one. And two, can we have feedback on how China is doing with their phase one agreement that we had from two years ago? Well, I, there is a commitment to trade and it, and it starts with enforcing the trade agreements we have so that people can rebuild the trust in the, in the concept of trade and trading relationships. Let's talk about China. Uh, they are $16 billion short of their phase one uh, trade uh, responsibilities from a purchasing perspective. 
th uh, uh, 13 billion in the first year, 3 billion last year. Uh, we yet to see what, uh, where, where things will be in, in 2022. There are seven major issues on the biotech, uh, or on the uh, sanitary and, and sanitary uh, side of the equation. Biotech approvals, DDGs, uh, ethanol, uh, ractopamine and pork, uh, issues that uh, hormones and beef had, that have not yet been resolved to the complete satisfaction of the agreement. We're pushing on both of those aspects, more purchases, completing uh, the vital sanitary and sanitary requirements of that agreement. Sorry, I yield back the balance of my time, and thank you for uh, uh, the answers to the questions, sir, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. The gentleman from California, Mr. Garbahal, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome, Secretary Vilsack. As you know, Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo counties are home to a wide array of specialty crop uh, production. Shipping delays and continuing labor shortages have caused supply chain disruptions, which are amplified by the perishable nature of our fresh fruits and vegetables grown in my district. The pandemic has also shown us the high demand for getting fresh and nutritious produce to hungry Americans. Secretary Vilsack, is the USDA taking any steps to ensure its Agriculture Market Service, AMS, commodity purchases for domestic food programs include an increased amount of fresh fruits and vegetables in an effort to better meet broader USDA nutritional guidelines? The answer to that question is yes. Uh, in uh, a recently announced flexible uh, temporary uh, food assistance emergency uh, program, TFAP, uh, we allocated uh, $400 million uh, for purchases with, from local and regional uh, food uh, uh, distributors with the understanding that they were to provide an opportunity for fresh fruit and produce to be part of those purchases. We've also uh, provided school districts with additional resources with the same uh, directive and the same opportunity for using those additional resources for purchasing of specialty crops. So uh, that is absolutely uh, one of the priorities and one of the areas that we're focused on. Thank you. Um, as you know, labor shortages have continued to be an issue and at the forefront of many of our discussions regarding agriculture. I've met with many stakeholders in my district and had this very same discussion about labor. That is why I was part of a bipartisan group of members that worked to pass the Farm Workforce Modernization Act last March, which is currently pending action in the Senate. Can you touch on what the Biden administration is doing to help advance this important legislation? And on a related note, could you elaborate on the USDA's efforts to conduct research on mechanization technologies, which could also help alleviate labor shortages for specialty crop growers, and at the same time, improve conditions for farm workers? Well, I know that there is research at uh, land-grant universities that uh, uh, we are funding in terms of robotics and the ability uh, of uh, the capacity of the robotics to be able to sense when food is ready to be picked and harvested. Uh, I will tell you that, uh, you know, disappointed obviously uh, in, in the fact that the parliamentarian in the Senate did not allow for the inclusion of the Farm Worker Modernization Act uh, in the Build Back Better legislation that's currently uh, before the Senate. Uh, I think there is still an opportunity and a hope uh, that enough, uh, there's enough bipartisan support uh, to get this passed. It is absolutely vital. It's absolutely essential. Uh, and I would say it's going to require some political courage on the part of folks to stand up to those who want to use immigration as a political wedge issue. And the time for that is over. Uh, the time for, especially with labor shortages, I've heard it here today, uh, one of the answers to labor shortages is having a working immigration system. Uh, and it requires, I think, a bipartisan effort. And hopefully there are enough people of, of courage and conviction uh, in the United States Senate to get this done. It's long overdue. Well said, thank you. The Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021 included important language extending SNAP eligibility to college students who are eligible for work study and those have, who have an expected family contribution of zero. However, this flexibility is not permanent and I'm concerned about the looming hunger cliff that participating college students may ultimately face. How will the end of this provision impact food security among college students? 
Well, at, this, at the present time, because of the extension of the public health uh, emergency, that uh, opportunity still exists for college students. But, you know, Congressman, I think one of the things we have to do is I think we have to begin educating people around the country uh, who these college students are and why they may be slightly different than the college uh, students uh, of a time when I went to school and perhaps when you went to school. There's a significant difference in the population of people going to school with a significant amount of individual challenges that create food insecurity among those young people. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why looking at the SNAP program and adjustments to the SNAP program may make some sense given the nature and the breakdown of college students today, which is really different. There are single parents, there are, uh, there are young people who are, are, are sort of disconnected from families. There, there, there's a variety of challenges these young people face. Uh, and I think we have to do a better job of educating folks about precisely who these people are. Thank you very much. My time is up. I yield back. The general lady from Florida, Mrs. Kamek, is now recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, uh, Chairman Scott. Thank you to uh, Secretary Vilsack. I appreciate your time here today. I've got a litany of questions, so I'm just going to jump right into them. Uh, Mr. Secretary, as you know, Florida is a, uh, a heavy fluid milk state. Our farms are much larger uh, than many areas of the country. Very strong class one production. Now, the, this is in regard to, to the uh, volatility assistance program. Now, when the program was instituted, it was very welcome help and, and much appreciated. But the five million pound per producer cap, which was instituted solely at the discretion of the administration, will have the effect of significantly limiting reimbursements to many of my producers. Keep in mind, these are family operations by and large. Now, uh, my colleague, uh, Representative Lawson and I, we are working in a bipartisan way to try to solve this problem to secure additional funding for this program. We actually sent you a letter back in October, have not received a response. So uh, this is a really important issue, I know, to many of our producers across the state of Florida, um, but I know this is important to you as well. So I'd like to just first ask, as we work through this, will you commit to working with us to make sure that this funding helps to close the gap for many of our producers who were hit very badly by the 2020 losses? Well, I'm happy to work on this issue. Uh, I think we structured the program uh, so that it provided the help to the farmers who were most uh, disadvantaged by the way in which the market was adjusted and adapted to uh, the food box programs and other, other challenges during the pandemic. Um, we're obviously looking for ways in which we can provide help and assistance, but uh, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to take a, a, a I'm not going to apologize, if you will, for the for the five million pound threshold because it was designed for those very small and mid-sized dairy operations uh, to benefit. Uh, we have other things that provided help and assistance to the dairy industry, not the least of which is the Supplemental Dairy Margin Protection Program and the restructuring of that, uh, pretty important to the dairy industry as well. Well, and, and Mr. Secretary, I understand. I mean, I understand where it was targeted at. Um, we sustained um, millions, millions in, in losses. And again, these are family operations. These aren't major corporate entities. Um, Florida, by, by given you know, the class one milk market that we are in, you know, we sustained a, a unique situation in Florida. But I do look forward to working with you on it. Um, I'm gonna redirect here now to a, a, another topic that I think is really important to highlight, and that's broadband. Obviously, we uh, would like to see some better coordination to make sure that there's not overbuilding because we have several areas of rural America that um, programs like Reconnect um, would be beneficial in. But because of the multiple programs through FCC as well as USDA and others, we're seeing overbuilding as a real issue. But one of the, the topics that hasn't been touched on here today is, you know, I, I would think that USDA would want to encourage as many broadband providers as possible to participate in USDA programs, but some of the scoring preferences for round three of the ReConnect program seem to work against that goal. Now, for example, providers are awarded points in the application process for a quote unquote commitment to net neutrality. That is actually the language in the program. Now, Mr. Secretary, you were fully aware that the net neutrality rules were repealed by the FCC in 2018, correct? Well, I'm also aware of the fact that we want to make sure that folks have access to uh, as much 
capacity and much opportunity to use the Internet as possible, and that they shouldn't necessarily be restricted or confined uh, to choices that the provider provides. And that's the reason here, is to make sure that folks have the full range of, of capacities available with the Internet. So what does the department plan to do to police uh, the net neutrality, uh, because this is USDA, not FCC, if the provider is not living up to the obligations to commit to net neutrality? How does that benefit the deployment of a variety of different services and providers in rural America? Well, the, the point of this is to make sure in the application that there is a process and a, a mechanism by which we can assure performance. And obviously, there there is resources being provided over a period of time and if the and if it turns out that the uh, that the services are not what people have promised why then there's there are recourses to basically suggest a repayment of those resources and so at the end of the day it's in it's financially uh, uh, beneficial for folks to try to see if they can live up to their responsibilities in their application if they don't want it if they don't want to use that if they don't want it they don't want to make uh, that Mr. commitment. They don't Mr. have Secretary, to make that I'm commitment. I'm so sorry. i got to reclaim my time. I only have a few seconds left. So I, at this point, I would like to uh, request a step-by-step -step plan from the department on its enforcement, how you define that neutrality, how that is contradictory to FCC rules that uh, were repealed in 2018. And I would certainly appreciate a follow-up from you, Mr. Secretary. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman, the gentleman from California, Mr. Harder, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for joining us uh, this this afternoon. Um, I really appreciated your your chance to, to connect and come to our district, even virtually, uh, last year. One of the topics that we spent a lot of time discussing discussing was was wildfires and especially what the department's plan is going to be. And I appreciate the rollout uh, this week of how the bipartisan infrastructure deal is going to inform some of the investments that the department is, make, is going to make to make sure that we hopefully can prevent some of these uh, terrible fires we've seen over the last couple of years across the West. Um, one of the challenges there is, is reimbursements, especially for our local, poli uh, local fire departments. I was talking to one of the fire chiefs in, in our city of Patterson uh, recently, and, and he let me know that he had to wait over a year before he could get reimbursement for, from the Forest Service for one of the fires that they actually helped support. And this is becoming more and more common as these fires are getting bigger. We're having more uh, local fire departments spend weeks, even months, on this federal land helping support the, the, the Forest Service. And it's not just the timing of the reimbursements that's often so long, it's the clarity of what exactly they're, they're getting. Um, you know, I've, I've talked to some of our fire departments who have told me that one document will say one amount and another document will say another, and it's really hard for them to understand how much they're actually being, being reimbursed. I know there's cost sharing agreements that, that govern this, but uh, it, the, the GAO recently published a report uh, that noted all the ways in which this seems to be to be falling short and uh, some of the challenges that it inflicts on our local fire departments. Uh, can you talk about what the department is planning to do to address the GAO's concerns on reimbursement for these wildfires to our local fire departments? We're going to try to simplify the process a bit, but I would say that oftentimes uh, uh, the, the challenge is actually getting information, and especially in California, getting information back from the local communities in terms of what they, what they are uh, re seeking reimbursement for. Uh, so they, I think it's a two-way street here in terms of transparency and, and cooperation. Uh, but I do understand and appreciate that we need to speed up the process, and I think we're committed to doing that um, if we are able to get the same level of cooperation from the, from the, local, uh, the local folks. Well, that's great to hear. Um, it, it's just a, uh, puts folks in a really tough spot, especially when we have very small fire departments or even volunteer uh, fire departments to have a huge portion of their budget uh, be um, be very unclear for for months, even even up to even up to a year or or longer. I'll be introducing legislation soon uh, that suggests a couple fixes to addressing this. Uh, I'd love to get any comments from uh, the, the, the department and, and you and your team if there's things that we could be doing at a legislative level uh, to support. Um, can, I, can I count on your support of that legislation to, to try to do what we can to, uh, to address this issue? We'll be happy to provide you the technical assistance you need, Congressman. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, I also wanted to ask another question about the wildfire plan that came out um, 
uh, this week based on the bipartisan infrastructure investments that we passed last year. Uh, one of the things that that this plan is intended to do is to triple the number of acres up to 75 million acres over the next 10 years is my understanding uh, of trying to do more reduction of fuels to try to make sure that these fires uh, don't continue to be as bad as they are. What, what further investments, if any, do you think are necessary uh, to try to get um, this, this, uh, this, this wildfire challenge under control? Well, I, I would say that a consistency in funding is necessary. I think what the what you all have provided in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which the President supported and pushed, uh, is sufficient resources for the next couple of years. The question is whether or not we are in a position to have that same level of funding and support for years four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, because it's going to take a while for us to get the hazardous fuel reduction down. It's going to take us a while to do the reforestation and the restoration work that needs to be done in areas that have already been impacted by fire. Uh, so I think consistency in funding it would be how I would respond to your question. Uh, but it's great that we have these resources. Uh, I know the Forest Service and the Department of Interior are going to work very collaboratively with state and local folks. Uh, to, to do as much work as possible. Uh, it's a 350 percent increase in the level of commitment and funding for, for hazardous fuel reduction. So I think, and it's going to be focused on the areas of highest risk to communities. So uh, hopefully over time, people will begin to see fewer catastrophic fires and certainly less risk to people and property uh, and to key forest areas. Wonderful. Thank you so much. The gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Moore is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, earlier in your response to Mr. Allen, you mentioned a court case regarding poultry line speeds and the potential for a pilot program similar to the one announced for pork plants in November. In responding to Mr. Rouser, you touted the pork pilot program as successful and a positive path forward. But I completely disagree. The affected pork plants were already operating safe and at higher speeds before this administration failed to defend the NSIS program. And since the new pilot program was announced in November, none of the plants have been approved to participate. Can you elaborate, Mr. Secretary, on what you're referring to regarding the poultry program? And secondly, when can we expect the pork program trials to actually begin? Well, we're anxious to approve those, the five companies that have made a request and making sure that uh, it is consistent with uh, the the promise and commitment that we've made to try to balance uh, worker safety, uh, plant speeds, and, and profits for farmers. Uh, a federal judge in Minneapolis basically uh, ended uh, the line speed effort in, in, in pork, and it did for one reason, and one reason only. Uh, the Trump administration did not include any consideration during the course of the calculation of that rule about worker safety. They, they had data, they had information, they decided not to include it. And it was a, a, you know, a significant problem from, a, from a, a litigative standpoint. So there was no recourse here. Uh, so the recourse is, what do you do in the face of a federal judge that basically is stri stri strikes the rule? You go back to the companies in the industry and say, how can we work through this? And that's what we did. Uh, and I think we're going to see uh, these, uh, these approvals in the very near future. On the poultry side, we have a, an existing case, and we're asking the court to give us the opportunity to sort of remand the case back to the USDA so that the USDA is in a position to try to create the same kind of opportunity on the poultry side as on the pork side. And the point of this is to make sure that we do a better job of balancing safety profits, and processing line speeds. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Let me add a comment. I've got to go. I'm out of time. But, you know, I, I've heard a ton of poultry plants in my lifetime. That's my background. That's my degree. And 91 to 93 birds per minute is what we're producing. And we were doing that safely. With empty shelves in grocery stores and slowing production down and starting to inhibit that, I think we're going to continue to see the American consumer look for protein products on shelves. And so I just want to say, you know, we need to be careful sometimes. We overregulate stuff, and, and it slows down the process. I've seen these plants. They seem to work fairly safely. And the American consumer right now needs food on shelves, and we don't need more regulations. Thank you, and my time's up. The gentlewoman from Iowa, Ms. Actony, is recognized for five minutes. 
Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, uh, Secretary Vilsack, for being here. It's always good uh, to be here with my former boss from the state of Iowa and my uh, current constituent. Uh, so thank you so much, Secretary, for all the work that you're doing. And I also want to thank you and President Biden for the announcement uh, this month on increasing competition and resiliency in our cattle markets. As you know, the lack of competition and transparency is critical uh, for Iowa's independent cattle producers and the funds announced by the USDA will go a heck of a long way to expand processing options for those folks. So my first question is um, in regard to the announcement, it also referenced my legislation, the Cattle Price Discovery and Transparency Act, bipartisan legislation that will help facilitate actual negotiations of pricing between producers and packers through establishing a regional minimum for the cash market. And the bill uh, led in the Senate by my fellow Iowan Senator Grassley uh, would help improve price discovery and market fairness for cattle producers. Mr. Secretary, I question, will giving producers more leverage and market information help address some of the issues that we're seeing in our cattle markets? Absolutely, uh, Congresswoman, uh, because if you, if you have greater transparency then you have greater confidence that the market price that you're receiving at any particular point in time is a fair price. And I think there are many, many, many producers out there that feel that they are not currently getting a fair price. Well, thank you for helping us make that transparent for our Iowa producers. Another issue, and I'm sure you've been hearing this, uh, but I've been hearing this as of late, is that Iowa farmers are concerned about the high cost of fertilizer this season, in particular, of course, with our corn producers. Um, they've seen the highest cost of fertilizer per acre for any commodity out there. And some uh, farmers, unfortunately, are considering planting less this spring due to this increased cost. I know you've been watching this closely, Mr. Secretary. So I'm curious to see what you think the reasons are for this volatility and what steps the USDA and Congress can take uh, to address this issue. Part of the reason is uh, strong global demand uh, and domestic demand. Part of the reason is that uh, we are reliant on outside sources for some of the fertilizer that we use, and those outside sources have made the decision to impose export controls, which makes it difficult for, to get the supply into the U.S. Uh, part of the reason, uh, I think, is that we, we need to continue to accelerate significantly our efforts in precision agriculture so that the application of fertilizer is strategic and thoughtful. Um, Iowa State, I mentioned this earlier, Iowa State has research to suggest that maybe as much as 30 percent of corn acres today may not require any fertilizer at all. If we can provide uh, producers with sensor uh, materials and sensor uh, information and, and technology that will allow them to more accurately understand precisely where and how to utilize fertilizer, we could potentially lower those input costs. And finally, I think that, you know, it's important for people to take advantage of the program that we just recently announced, the split nitrogen program uh, at, at uh, the risk management, uh, the opportunity potentially uh, to, to, to obtain some protection if you make the decision to split your nitrogen uh, and apply it only once a year as opposed to twice a year. Uh, if there are crop reductions, maybe there's a way in which you can be compensated for those reductions. So I think there are a multitude of things we need to be doing uh, in the long term and in the short term, folks need to take advantage of the tools that are available. I absolutely appreciate that. And as we continue to discuss this and further down the road, I, I definitely want to talk more on precision agriculture as we roll out broadband as part of our infrastructure bill. But this idea, as you mentioned, to ensure that those farmers actually have then that access to that precision agriculture, get the connectivity, but make sure they've got what they need to, to use that. So thank you for addressing that. One, one last question. I have lots of questions for you, Secretary, but I want to st uh, end on cover crops. And thank you for the focus that you have in the USDA on cover crops. Uh, the creation of the pandemic cover crop program in 2021 provided a first step to incentivize broader adoption of soil health practices that can help turn agriculture into a greater solution to the climate crisis. Can you please elaborate for us on the USDA's plan to roll out a 2022 pandemic cover crop program and could you give us a sense of how many acres would be covered by that 2022 program and how many acres did the USDA enroll in the 2021 program as well? Uh, the 2021 program was somewhere between 12 and 14 million acres, maybe as high as 15 million acres. The goal here is to get to 30 million acres eventually. It's one of the reasons why we were excited about the soil health initiative uh, uh, with the Soybean uh, uh, Association and a number of other commodity groups. Uh, the uh, Soil Health Institute uh, basically committing 
to working to doubling the level of, of uh, cover crop acres in the United States from roughly 15 million to 30 million by 2030. Uh, we continue to look ways in which we can uh, provide incentives. Uh, RMA is going to roll out the program for 2022 very shortly. Uh, and the hope is that we'll see ever increasing uh, interest in getting a reduction in crop insurance uh, in exchange for uh, maintenance of these uh, Im important cover crops. Um, in the meantime, we're also going to look for ways in which we can expand market opportunities also for the cover crops. The general lady from Minnesota, Ms. Fishback, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, uh, Mr. Secretary, regarding your agency's most recent announcement on the availability of loans and grants for additional meat processing capacity, uh, can you give us any additional detail regarding the details of the loans that will be available? Uh, for example, what will the guarantee fee or the loan limit be on those loans? The purpose of the loans is obviously to provide a low interest to financing so that uh, folks who are interested in expanding or building new, new capacity are in a position to be able to uh, uh, get the capital necessary. Uh, we also, I should point out that we also have a commitment to, to expanding work, worker training uh, in this area. Uh, we need more workers and we're going to try to work with community colleges and other, uh, other partners to try to provide uh, additional workforce. Well, and more directly, uh, the question was about the loans and if there was any information. My office has been fielding questions regarding the application process and it, uh, and timing. Do you have anything sure. to add in that regard? The first uh, the first tranche of resources will be grant resources, one hundred and fifty million dollars, and we hope to be able to get that framework out uh, in the next uh, several weeks. The idea being uh, those shovel ready. Uh, programs uh, and, and projects that are ready to go but just need a push, this will provide that push. Then this summer, uh, we hope to put out both the $225 million of additional grant money as, as well as the $275 million in, in loans. Uh, in the meantime, there's also a loan guarantee program that's available uh, that we announced uh, several months ago that folks might take a look at as well. Okay, and, and uh, Mr. Secretary, how will this new program um, differ from the current BNI program in the terms and offering uh, and administration? Well, that's that's a business and industry loan program, which is a loan guarantee program. Uh, this yes. this financing uh, could very well be direct loans from USDA. So there there's that difference. Uh, there may be a guaranteed portion of it too. Uh, we'll be basically getting input from the industry in terms of how best to structure this to meet the needs that are out there. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Secretary. And and it, it might be helpful if you, you kept uh, Congress uh, informed about how that is going since we are you know kind of that first direct uh, line for constituents to call. Um, but switching, uh, switching gears a little bit, uh, you mentioned earlier, I believe it was in your opening comments or at least one of the very first questions, um, you know, about keeping dollars in rural areas. So uh, with that in mind, I wanted to just ask about some of the uh, renewable fuels and, you know, cutting the amount of renewable fuels that are blended increases the level of petroleum based products in the market in the marketplace, uh, hampering our efforts to fight climate change. And despite the fact that uh, the administration is considering reducing the renewable volume obligation for biofuels in 2020, 2021, and even 2022, ignoring congressional intent of the RFS implementation, uh, what economic, um, and particularly economic and climate impacts would reducing biofuel blending have on corn farmers and rural communities throughout the U.S.? Well, let, let's be clear about this, Congresswoman. Uh, the, the 2022 number is a record amount. Uh, it's not a decrease, it's a record amount. And the 20 uh, and 2021 20, numbers are basically uh, reflecting the reality of the pandemic. Uh, so I, I think it's, a, it's an honest set of numbers as opposed to what happened in the previous administration where numbers were set and then waivers were granted to undercut those numbers. And that was, uh, the announcements were accompanied with 65 waiver denials uh, by the EPA. So I think uh, it, it, these numbers are, are, are uh, the, the 2022 number, a historic number, is it puts us on a trajectory of growth. And don't forget the aviation biofuel opportunity, which is enormous because it, it, it's triple, the, double the size of the existing biofuel industry. Uh, so there's tremendous Secretary, opportunity I, here. 
Mr. Secretary, reclaiming my time, I just have a couple of extra minutes, seconds, but I just wanted to say, Mr. Secretary, I hope that you are committed to those uh, biofuels because they are part of the solution for climate change and they have been forgotten in this, uh, in this in this new climate change argument that people are making. And so I want to make sure people understand that they are reducing uh, emissions and that we are, that our USDA secretary is pushing for that for the farmers that are producing that. Uh, Thank uh, you. With that, I yield back. I'm confident that I am one of the most ardent proponents of biofuels anywhere in this country and have been for years, decades. The general lady yields back. The gentleman from California, Mr. Panetta, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate this opportunity and appreciate you holding uh, this uh, hearing where we get to hear from the Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, Secretary Vilsack, good to see you and thank you very much for being here today. Uh, truly appreciate you uh, showing up to Capitol Hill. Uh, showing up out in our communities and uh, basically enduring this long line of questioning, uh, the questions that you're getting. So thank you. Also, uh, as you may know, uh, I hail from the central coast of California out there in the Salinas, uh, Pajaro and San Juan Valleys. Uh, please know you have an open invitation uh, to come out and see our specialty crop producers, our farmers and our farm workers who would love to hear from you out there. Uh, and, and also want to appreciate uh, your uh, considering that going forward. Uh, as you know, um, with our specialty crops, uh, you know, mainly our issues are big issue is harvesting, therefore it takes humans. Obviously, you know well that uh, no technology is yet able to replace the human discernment of when it comes to picking a ripe, uh, safe, clean, aesthetically pleasing uh, strawberry and so many other soft fruits and vegetables. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, the fact that we don't have immigration reform makes it very difficult. I want to thank you for your personal efforts with the Senate to go up there and push forward the Farm Workforce Modernization Act. I know you've, doing, you're, you've done that. I know you'll continue to do that. Hopefully we can get that uh, on uh, some members, uh, especially a Republican senator's uh, table so that they can also be a champion, uh, especially something that will help their states going forward. And that's immigration reform for our domestic ag workers. So thank you for your uh, efforts in that. But I also, um, look, I, I, right now, I, I don't wanna ask to talk about the lack of immigration reform, uh, but I wanna pivot to what we're relying on, what our producers are relying on now and what they need to rely on in the future. Obviously, uh, we, our domestic workforce is shrinking and it's aging. Therefore, the only game in town or one of the few games in town is the H-2A program. My producers are running into a couple of difficulties. Don't get me wrong, it's been working okay, but there are some difficulties with it. One of them is that they're experiencing delays dealing with the DOL. Uh, the DOL, I get it because of COVID pandemic, people not showing up to work. There's a lot of delays in receiving their H-2A visas. There's rejected, rejections of their petitions for minor errors, and there's really late or lacking communication from the DOL. My question to you, sir, is have you heard of this? Is the USDA engaging with the DOL to make the only game in town, the H-2A process, actually work for our producers there on the Central Coast? We're cognizant of the concerns that people have expressed about H-2A and, and happy to work with the Department of Labor uh, to underscore the importance and necessity of getting uh, the processing of this done quickly and expeditiously. Uh, we, it is a serious issue and we're certainly aware of it. Thank you. Another issue they're starting to experiencing right now is DHS expecting their workers to be vaccinated before coming in uh, to the country. Is that something you're hearing about? Is that something you're willing to work with us on to maybe try to find a compromise as to what we can do? What we did on the Central Coast, we ran our own mass vaccine clinics with our federally, uh, federally qualified health clinics, our producers, our farmers, and our farm workers basically getting shots in arms to the H-2A workers that are coming in. Are you willing to work on some sort of compromise when it comes to dealing with DHS on that type of mandate? I, I, I'm happy to work uh, on this issue and learn more about it, Congressman. Great, thank, thank you. Obviously, you've heard from my colleagues about mechanization. Please know that myself and Rodney Davis were the ones who worked hard uh, to get that language into the 2018 Farm Bill to put mechanization under the SCRI and, and AFRI and know that uh, coming up on the next Farm Bill, you're gonna hear more from us as well as my other colleagues, uh, apparently when it comes to mechanization, obviously something that's needed. Uh, wanna commend you for your strategy on the wildfire crisis. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we not just have a, a lot of bounty, we obviously have a lot of forests out there on the central coast. 
One of the issues that I'm hearing about is the lack of staffing. Um, as you know, 80% of fires there in our national forests are caused by humans. Um, I think a way to do that is having more forest service personnel on the ground. Uh, is your department working to address the critical staff shortages that our national forces, forests are enduring right now? We are. We're uh, converting temporary workers, about 1,000 workers, to full-time status. We're also uh, increasing the compensation and looking at ways in which we can reclassify firefighters to encourage uh, more recruitment. Uh, so all three, things, all three of those things are being done. Real quickly, uh, my bill, the Replant Act, was included in the IIJA. It's about reforestation. Do you know when we can start to see those investments uh, be implemented? Well, I can tell you that Mitch Landry wants us to get, uh, and the President wants us to get those uh, resources in the field as quickly as possible. On time, on budget, and on, on task. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Jacobs, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary, uh, and thank you for being here today. Uh, it was a pleasure to talk with you uh, a couple months ago on the phone, and uh, I represent again uh, Western New York uh, between Buffalo and out the outskirts of Buffalo and outskirts of Rochester, and I know you know that area fairly well, having gone to college out this way. Uh, I, many of the, the questions I had have already been asked. I just wanted to touch on one real quick, just to reiterate how important in our region, as you know, right right on the border of Canada is the uh, resolution of this uh, agreement, uh, uh, the, this, the dispute resolution uh, ruling in our favor in regards to dairy and uh, the, the tariffs. And, and that uh, I, I know that you're going to work alongside the trade rep to make sure that Canada now adheres to the, the ruling there uh, so we can uh, for finally open up that market that we've been trying to get into in, in Canada for our dairy. Uh, I, but I wanted to just ask, uh, from your opening remarks, I was very interested in the, the terminology of the, the circular economy that you mentioned. I not heard it that way, uh, but it's something I've really thought a lot about in an area like ours uh, where we're trying to find ways to continue to have our agriculture sector thrive. And I've seen a few examples of what I, I now will call the, the, the agriculture economy, uh, I mean, the, the circular economy. Uh, one. Uh, we have one ethanol plant in our area, which is fairly rare for our area. And the, the initiative for that 20 years ago, uh, it's outside Medina, uh, it was that uh, many of the corn producers there were, uh, were just not able to uh, survive because of the drop in the market prices and, um, and other competition from abroad and so forth. Uh, so this corn grower took it on himself and started an ethanol plant. And that plant now is servicing, and, it, and they've ex, actually expanded corn growing in that area. Uh, we also, in Batavia, New York, uh, filled uh, the economic development folks there, filled an old factory with HP Hood, uh, where they make non-dairy dairy creamers and, and other, other products, uh, 250 jobs. But also, it's a source that the raw materials are coming from our dairy farmers to supply that. So my question to you is, um, how... In, in articulating this, this uh, concept of the circular economy, what can we do to, to really make that a reality, a uh, more commonplace? Uh, and uh, I just love your thoughts on that because I think it really is critically important that we do more of that in regions uh, like mine uh, to assure that farmers can have uh, a thriving uh, future moving forward. Thank you. I, I think a commitment uh, uh, to more new and better markets, and now that sounds like something simple, but the reality is we have got to create different avenues, different ways in which farmers can benefit from whatever they do on their land. Uh, traditionally, they grow crops. They, uh, in some cases, they feed crops to livestock and then they sell the livestock. The question is what can we do to expand beyond those traditional ways while preserving them, accessing additional revenue opportunities? So to the extent that farmers could be paid for certain climate smart agricultural practices and create climate smart Commodities, that's one avenue. To the extent, as your uh, folks have figured out, they, they can convert agricultural products to a value-added product, whether it's uh, a creamery that produces ice cream or, or, or cheese, or whether it's an ethanol production facility, that's another opportunity. I think there are untapped opportunities in terms of agricultural waste, understanding how you essentially can, can separate 
the, the components of agricultural waste. Let me give you an example in the dairy industry. Um, you can, there's separation capacity now to be able to separate solids from liquids, to reclaim from the liquids a certain organic material that can be used for organic farming. That's a value-added ingredient opportunity that can be sold. You can take the rest of the liquids and reclaim it and, re and utilize it in scarce water resource areas. That's pretty important. You can take the balance, the solids, you can pelletize those solids and basically put it in a bag and you can basically ship that, uh, that fertilizer anywhere in the world. Or you can break it down even further and create component parts that could go into a chemical, into a material, into a fabric, uh, into an energy uh, 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 project, a, a wide variety of ways. And so we need to fund the research that allows that to happen. We need to fund the resources, the capital resources that enable those kinds of activities to be located in rural communities. So farmers have additional income opportunities. They create new job opportunities in rural areas. The wealth stays in the rural community. It doesn't travel a thousand miles away. Uh, thank you. Look forward to working with you on this great concept. The you gentleman know. from Florida, Mr. Lawson, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman Scott, uh, and, and thanks for having this meeting today. Mr. Valsack, I want to make sure uh, that I understood uh, uh, what you were saying when Congresswoman Kelmack, uh, uh, when we was talking about the joint effort that we had on a bipartisan basis, uh, concerning the dairies and the farmer, and you say you wouldn't apologize but to, to the way things are happening. Maybe I didn't quite understand you. Could you elaborate on that, please? Well, when the, uh, when the food box program was initiated, uh, there was a significant amount of cheese that was purchased for the food box program. Some folks made the decision as a result of that, as they saw prices go up, they made the decision to sort of pull out of the federal marketing order, which distorted the market. And it, the result was that smaller producers ended up getting perhaps not the price that they thought they would get or the distribution they thought they would get because of that disruption. And so what this was designed to do was was designed to provide equity, if you will, by providing some resource to reimburse those smaller producers who were who were disproportionately impacted and affected by that different, uh, that different pricing mechanism. Um, and so it's designed to provide that kind of assistance and help. And so we set a threshold of five, billion, five million pounds. That was designed to target the resources, target the assistance, target the help. So the letter, the joint letter that we sent in October, uh, uh, you all are gonna still respond to it uh, and see uh, what more can USDA do uh, uh, to help with the disparities that we have. Am I correct? Well, there are other programs that we instituted that may very well uh, provide assistance and help to larger scale producers. The Supplementary Dairy Margin Protection Program, for example, uh, creates an opportunity for people to adjust their production levels so that they are able to purchase or get more coverage and get more assistance. Uh, to the extent that they use high price alfalfa as feed, there was an adjustment made for that, all of which I think pay, plays to the potential for the larger operation. So it's, a tr it's an effort to try to make sure that we are balancing uh, uh, as best we can the help and assistance being provided to the people that need it the most. Okay, uh, thank you uh, for that answer. And I wanna say that, uh, as you know, citrus greening continue to devastate farmers across the United States and especially uh, uh, in uh, Florida. Since 2005, uh, my home state has uh, seen a decrease of 51% of its uh, commercial citrus land and since 2016, an estimated 4.6 billion have been lost in, in the Sunshine State. Uh, how can uh, uh, we, especially uh, in the next farm bill, well, I, I might say that we, because of this disease, the, the animal plant health protection uh, services, uh, I call it AP, uh, APIS, uh, uh, has been implemented. Uh, how can we, uh, uh, I think we asked for about, it was about 50 million that was, uh, was set aside from congressional appropriation to help uh, with this situation. Is that enough money for us to ask for in order for us to do something about the citrus interest and the disease, citrus disease? Uh, Congressman, I think you need to continue to fund research until we figure out how to solve this problem because it's obviously devastating. And I know from my pre previous stint as secretary, we saw increases uh, in commitment over a period of years 
uh, and, and some potential uh, strategies that may, may, have, uh, may have merit. Uh, but I think you need to continue to fund and finance the, the research necessary to figure this out. Okay, one quick question before my time run out. Have any progress been made on insurance uh, for timber uh, because of the devastating that we've had from hurricanes? Uh, those, well, let's see. Uh, I'm not sure I understand your question. Uh, we're obviously, to the extent that there are applications out for, for additional support and help as a result of, uh, of timber loss, uh, those will be processed. But if you're asking about timber harvesting in, uh, that was impacted by the pandemic, those resources have been provided to, uh, to I think, several thousand um, timber uh, haulers and, and harvesters. Okay, so a lot of the individual uh, farmers that uh, uh, use this for, you know, retirement purposes and so forth, would they qualify for any of those funding? I'm not sure of that, Congressman. Let me check with our team and get back to you. Okay, with that, I yield back. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Cloud, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman, and uh, thank you, Secretary, for being with us today. And I wanted to start off by thanking you for working with our office following the Texas freeze to revise the rule to provide an avenue of relief for aquaculture and specifically our, our red fish farmers. It was much appreciated. And uh, so, so thank you very much for that. Um, as you know, of course, we are facing a number of crises in our nation at, at the moment, and it's certainly affecting our rural communities. Uh, when I speak with farmers and ranchers in my district throughout Texas, they're concerned, of course, about labor shortages, exacerbated in part by the unconstitutional vaccine mandates, monetary policy and supply chain breakdown that's leading to massive inflation. A as you know, costs are going up uh, for parts if you can find them. Fertilizer and pesticides are expensive and hard to come by, uh, in part because of kind of the assault against natural gas that we've seen uh, lately. If we don't fix this, it's going to lead to even more empty shelves at the grocery store, potentially, and even higher food prices. I haven't yet heard a farmer or a rancher ask me if only I had an electric tractor, uh, but that's what our hearing was uh, about last week. What I do hear is they would like to get parts for the tractor that they already do own. But I, I will say the biggest issue that I hear from farmers and ranchers in South Texas by far is what they're concerned about is, is the border. It's border security. Um, and I'd like to submit a few articles for the record without uh, objection. Uh, farm progress border situation threatens farmers' livelihood. Uh, Daily Mail, this needs to stop. Texas farmer finds five abandoned migrant girls, including a baby under the age of seven, crying and hungry on his land. Texas ranchers pummeled by Biden's border crisis, fear for their lives. And uh, Texas Rancher says he and his neighbors find bodies of migrants on their properties. And, and this is true. It's become a, a daily thing really for the ag community in Texas to have to personally carry the burden for our, our border crisis. So that comes in the way of them paying tens of thousands of dollars to repair fences that have been run through because of uh, bailouts or they've been cut by human traffickers. Crops are destroyed uh, or contaminated from foot traffic. Water sources are compromised. Vehicles are stolen. Families do fear for their lives on their own property because of emboldened cartels. Uh, and it isn't uncommon to find drugs or tragically dead migrants on their property. Uh, and so on June 3rd of last year, the American Farm Bureau Federation sent you, Secretary Mayorkas and Secretary Holland, uh, what a letter dealing uh, talking about this it, it was signed from what i can tell is all 50 state farm bureaus as well today they tell me they haven't received a response yes. um and so can you commit to conveying the concerns of the ag community uh certainly in texas but this was signed by uh every state uh for to convey those concerns to to the white house uh could you reply to this letter and then uh, would would you be able to work with our office in seeing what we can do to relieve the burden? Again, they're having to personally pay for Con the burden of what is supposed to be a national security issue. Congressman, first of all, I have I have personally communicated to uh, 50 state presidents of the Farm Bureau about this issue. Uh, we did provide a response, 
and we do have okay. roughly rough, we, we do have roughly three million dollars of equip resources that are now and have been available for some time uh, for producers to be able to be compensated or reimbursed for the expenses that they're incurring uh, as a result of fence repairs and so forth. So that program has been set up. Okay, well, uh, thank you. I appreciate that, and uh, we will follow up then and figure out how to get that to the farmers and ranchers because uh, they're not aware of it in our district. So I will be happy to work with you on that. And, and so thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, one other issue that I do hear a lot about is the issue, though, of the FSA offices uh, and the staffing issues. Um, uh, again, they're trying to apply, and they're having trouble finding uh, employees who can help them. Sometimes the offices are closed. Sometimes they're filling out um, filling out applications in the parking lot. The staff has said that they're working in a program called Jabber uh, when they're re working remotely. And anytime they get a call, apparently they have to log out and log back in, which is creating some inefficiencies. Um, we led a letter from the oversight committee that, that also serve in uh, to the FSA inquiring about the status of reopening uh, and other staffing issues. We haven't received a response to that letter, to my knowledge. Um, can, can you reply to that, but then also could you speak to how many employees, including those in state and in the country, uh, in, or in county USDA offices, like the Farm Service Agency offices have been left or forced to leave the USDA as a result of vaccine mandates. And can you speak to how the USDA is weighing religious and medical exemptions from the vaccine mandate? Mr. Chairman, can I respond to that even though the time's up? Uh, yes, you may. First of all, uh, we track uh, and sur survey uh, activities in our farm service agency offices to make sure that the work is getting done and we compare it to where things were relative to pre-pandemic at, 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 at the same time. I have seen that survey and it has indicated that we are on, on track to do the level of work that was done pre-pandemic. I mentioned earlier the tens of thousands of loans, the billions of dollars that our farm service folks have gotten out from pandemic assistance. I will tell you, they've done a remarkable job. They have done a remarkable job. Um, I can tell you that, that at this point in time, roughly 600 people out of roughly 90,000 uh, have indicated, have, have failed to indicate whether they are vaccinated or requesting an accommodation. The 88, 89% of folks have been vaccinated. The other folks have requested an accommodation. We're going through those accommodation processes now. Uh, a number of them have been granted. Um, and in the meantime, all of those people, all 88, 88% of our workforce and the 10% of our workforce that's re requesting accommodation, all of those people are working. Uh, those who are requesting accommodations have just simply been asked to, to put a mask on, to socially distance, to protect themselves, and to protect their coworkers and their families and their communities. Um, the 600 or so that, uh, that failed to respond, they've been given several uh, letters and opportunities to respond by either getting vaccinated or to request an accommodation. Uh, I think some of them have requested an accommodation and they, they've moved into that process, which is good. Uh, we have begun uh, the first part of January uh, a graduated level uh, of, uh, of suspension uh, so that folks are given multiple opportunities uh, to make a choice whether to seek an accommodation either for health reasons or for religious reasons uh, or getting vaccinated. Uh, and at the end of the day, the work is getting done. Uh, and, I, you know, I, I just have nothing but admiration for the people that work for the Farm Service Agency and for all of the people that work at USD. I think they've done, on, on balance, a remarkable job under very difficult circumstances. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Well Thank you, Mr. Secretary. stated. The gentleman from Arizona, Mr. O'Halloran, is now recognized for five minutes. No, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, for holding this important meeting today. Uh, Secretary Vilsack, uh, it was great seeing you uh, once again. It, uh, it was a pleasure spending time with you out in Arizona on Tuesday. I look forward to working with you on issues facing Arizonans 
who are dealing with the impacts of wildfires, extreme drought, flooding, cost of food, and obviously making sure our farms in America survive uh, the, the recent issues that they face with the supply chain. The 10-year fire announcement is long overdue, and I'm pleased that USDA and Forest Service have committed to this plan. Unabated wildfire poses an extreme risk to our communities, families, and businesses. And I look forward to continuing to work closely with you and Chief Moore over the coming years to ensure that this remains on track and that lives and livelihoods are protected. I also want to specifically thank USDA and the Forest Service for their commitment to the four Forest Restoration Initiative, or FORFRI. Uh, FORFRI has the potential to transform Northern Arizona's forest ecosystems, protecting the region from catastrophic wildfire, uh, while protecting plant and wildlife diversity and economic development, along with our water resources. I also appreciate you visiting a small meat packer in Arizona. The issues of rising food costs are ones that every family is paying attention to. While I appreciate the administration's efforts to reduce food costs, the administration and its committee, this committee must work with stakeholders to deliver real relief that Americans deserve. I do want to make a quick comment about uh, Mr. Podesta's uh, staffing issue. Uh, I, I think that uh, law enforcement has to be filled in on one of those areas where staffing is in, in need. Uh, questions, uh, Secretary Vilsack, I have always been a fierce advocate for dedicated funding for broadband in our rural and tribal communities. USDA's ReConnect program is a key part of that strategy. Since the program's inception, Congress has dedicated over $4 billion for ReConnect, and there clearly is bipartisan support for this program. In the, this most recent round of applications, USDA increased the eligible areas to include areas that with service less than 120 speeds. While fast service is critical for rural economies to compete, can you discuss how the USDA is continuing to prioritize projects in areas without any broadband, like most of rural Arizona? Well, there, okay. the, the folks who go to the top of the list, if you will, from an application perspective, uh, Congressman, are those who, who don't even have 25.3 speed uh, uploads and download speeds. Uh, so that's a way of protecting, but it's also uh, the, the 120 uh, effort is really designed to reflect the reality that, it, that you can have broadband, but if we, if, if we just are satisfied with 25.3, it won't be long before those people don't have uh, adequate broadband at all uh, because they'll find that they can't have more than one person download something in the home or they won't have the ability to do distance learning or they won't have uh, adequate telemedicine capacity or they won't have precision agriculture available to their farmers. So the key here is to build a system that meets the demand today and creates the infrastructure that will allow for uh, continued expansion uh, as time goes on. Um, but with the understanding that those areas that are currently unserved uh, get, in essence, a priority or get to the top of the list. Uh, so I think it's, a, it's an effort to try to, to try to balance with these resources. And we've had uh, a number of projects, 181 projects, uh, uh, about a billion and a half have already been committed from the various programs that, you, that you've uh, funded, and we, we anticipate and expect decisions being made uh, very shortly uh, this year on the billion, 1.15 billion on round three, and then hopefully round four and five come after that. Thank you, Secretary. As a grandfather myself, I break my, it breaks my heart to see kids go hungry. Um, as many as 13 million kids don't know where they're getting their next meal, we have to do better. Uh, I appreciate the actions you have taken to address hunger, especially the revaluation re re of the Thrifty Food Program plan as dedicated, directed by the bipartisan 2018 Farm Bill, which uh, uh, I and many others on this committee passed. Uh, Mr. Secretary, can you tell us uh, what impact the reevaluation to the Thrifty has had in addressing hunger, especially among children? Well, it's provided additional resources at a time when uh, many families might have been faced with a cliff. Uh, we're also taking a look at ways in which we can continue to provide assistance and are encouraging states uh, to use the opportunities of the pandemic uh, EBT uh, program uh, to not only provide additional assistance now, but also during the summer. 
Uh, that's a very key area, uh, Congressman, the summer EPT program, and hopefully uh, states uh, uh, get their plans on file and we get them approved quickly. The gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Maine, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Secretary. Thank you for being here uh, this morning. I uh, appreciated uh, Congressman Cloud's comments and questions about the vaccine mandates a couple of questions ago and what they're doing to our FSA offices in Kansas and uh, and the ability to deliver those services. So, so thank you for, for that and attention there. I represent the big first district of Kansas, which is the third largest ag producing district um, in the country um, by dollars. International trade is a key component to economic growth and recovery. Uh, Mr. Secretary, just two years ago, China made a deal with the United States, the phase one China trade deal to import $36 billion worth of US ag products in 2020 and 2021. As you know, China failed to meet that commitment uh, by close to $7 billion, that's 20% against $7 billion. It feels like China's sole America Bill of Goods and that Biden administration has made no effort to rectify the situation. Uh, by refusing to hold China accountable, the Biden administration is hurting all American farmers, ranchers, and producers from wheat farmers in Kansas to rice growers in California. A few weeks ago, uh, I understand you stood on a stage in a room full of producers and acknowledged that China fell short on their end of the deal. And in response to our concerns, you said, uh, but here's the deal with our Chinese friends. They're light on what they've committed to purchase. And that's why Ambassador Tai, our U.S. Trade Representative, continues to converse with China about the necessity of living up totally and completely to the phase one trade agreement, making up that deficit over the next several years. The next several years was never part of this two-year deal that we're now at the end of. China said they would purchase a certain amount of ag products, and they didn't. Uh, Mr. Ernie, my question is, you know, I joined farmers and ranchers in their concern about this trade deficit with China and, and with your remarks. What should I tell Kansans about how you, Ambassador Tai, and, and President Biden are taking immediate action to hold China accountable so they buy our ag products and put upward pressure on prices? Well, uh, I think your uh, constituents uh, should be reminded that we have a record year in ag exports. Uh, a record uh, that was set in 2013 when I was secretary before was surpassed this year uh, or last year in 2021. And it's expected to anticipate that that record will be broken again this year so that you can talk about the fact that there have been two record years uh, of ag exports, which is uh, one of the reasons why commodity prices across the board are significantly stronger and higher than they were a year ago uh, today. Secondly, you can tell folks that people are that there is an ongoing negotiation with China uh, I don't know where your figures are coming from, but my figures say that they are $16 billion light. Um, and they are also light on seven very important uh, sanitary and phytosanitary barriers. Uh, and so we are giving uh, China, we're putting them on notice that th this is something that we want them to live up to the phase one agreement. Uh, we want our Mexican friends to live up to USMCA. We want our Canadian friends to live up to U USMCA. We want our trading partners to live up to agreements. And so the first and foremost program and step here is to indicate our focus on trade enforcement. And that's what we're doing. Uh, that's why we took Canada uh, and used the uh, USMCA process uh, to, to raise issues about the, the tariff rate quotas and they weren't fulfilling the responsibilities of USMCA. So th it's, it's not correct to suggest that we haven't done anything. Uh, it is indeed correct to suggest that we have asked the Chinese to increase more, more. Uh, and obviously, if they don't, then there are uh, a, a wide variety of ways in which we can respond to that, and, and, and no doubt we will. Yeah, and in my understanding, I think it's numbers I've seen. I think they're 16 billion short on the whole deal, 7 billion short on purchasing our ag products. But whatever it is, that they, they no, no, it's, six, we, it's 16 billion on the ag products. Okay, okay. The, uh, on the input side, the other big issue that I constantly hear from our producers is we've seen a four to five times increase in fertilizer cost, dramatically increasing input costs for producers here as we're starting to head into the spring. I know that, um, that you were asking about this earlier, and I think the response was that, that we should tell producers to, uh, to decrease the use of fertilizer. That's not gonna cut it for my producers who have had plans in place and crop rotations and, and, and such for years. A lot of this is, comes down to decreasing uh, import. You know, China's no longer exporting fertilizer like they were what do we do there? What should we tell farmers? And how do we improve it and really decrease 
input um, prices, as we're about to see our producers get squeezed, uh, their margins are going to be squeezed greatly if we don't do something quickly. Well, we've been historically uh, opposed to export controls, and we'll continue to be uh, historically opposed to export controls, number one. Number two, I think it is important and necessary, as farmers understand and learn more about precision agriculture, we're going to see farmers understand and appreciate the importance and opportunity to actually produce more with less. Uh, this is not a, su a suggestion where you simply eliminate the utilization of fertilizer. This is a suggestion where you understand and appreciate where it needs to be applied, right place, right time, right amount. I agree. Uh, and and a lot of my producers important. have done that done that for, that for a long, long time. They still have to buy fertilizer this year. The time of the gentleman has expired. The gentlewoman from Minnesota, Miss Craig, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and uh, Secretary Vilsack. Thank you so much for being with us today to give us an update on uh, the rural economy. Uh, I really appreciated uh, you visiting the second district last year and under Secretary Torres Small also visited my district back in December. So thank you so much to the USDA for the strong, strong partnership. Uh, I've got a brief comment and three quick questions to cover with you today, and I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to move quickly through them. First, a comment on risk management and the farm safety net. I was extremely glad to see the recent announcement that the risk management agency is adding PACE to its crop insurance offerings, which is going to help farmers manage risk as they invest in key conservation practices. As USDA continues to develop new programs, I want to reiterate my support for the farm programs that are already in place, including the federal crop insurance program. The farm safety net is critical for producers in my district, and I'll be working on that in the next farm bill. Question one uh, for you though, Mr. Secretary, first on, on biofuels. Uh, I want to thank you for support of renewable fuels over the years. I know we both see the benefit of biofuels for family farmers, as well as to meet our carbon reduction goals, which is why I'm pushing for the year round sales of E15. How do you see the administration utilizing biofuels like ethanol and biodiesel in achieving your transportation sector emission reduction goals? And how quickly can USDA uh, distribute the recently announced 100 million for biofuels infrastructure? Well, that resource is going to be made available very, very shortly, as well as the $700 million uh, to the biofuel industry. Uh, applications will be received very soon, and, and hopefully by the summer those monies will be distributed. Uh, in terms of E15, you know, we're working with our partners at EPA. Uh, I think they announced a, a, uh, uh, an effort to try to get input uh, from folks in terms of how best to institute uh, a, a statewide or nationwide, rather, uh, E15 mandate uh, or requirement or opportunity however you want to uh, phrase it. Uh, and I would say uh, it, it's, an, it's going to continue to play a critical role. I mean, I realize that people are, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of conversation about electric cars, but the reality is that we're still going to have for the foreseeable future, probably in my lifetime for sure, we're still going to have cars uh, that require uh, biofuel. And hopefully over time we have airplanes and ships that require biofuel. And in doing so, we will see an expanded biofuel industry. We won't see the, uh, the elimination of this industry. We will see the expansion of it, new opportunities, new jobs. Uh, so I'm excited about the industry, and I think the future is bright for the industry. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I know you have a lot of bipartisan support here on this uh, Zoom and in the meeting room for your statement there. Let's go back to the reason you were in Minnesota here uh, back in the summer, a question on drought relief. Uh, when, when the two of us spoke uh, in August in Minnesota, it was clear that you were thinking about how USDA can be, be better prepared to support farmers and ranchers in the upper Midwest if we have those uh, periods of extreme drought like we experienced this last year. What program changes is USDA considering to address future extreme regional droughts and uh, will you commit to partnering with this committee to address those solutions in the upcoming farm bill? And if you will, uh, about 30 seconds. Uh, well, we're obviously focusing on implement, implementing the $10 billion you all provided under WIP Plus uh, and trying to do that in a thoughtful and creative way and a fast way. Uh, secondly, I would suggest as you're putting the farm bill together that you understand the need for flexibility. You, you also need, you need to understand the regional differences as we develop programs. You know, I know it's easier to do a nationwide program, but the reality is we're, 
we're so complicated in agriculture that we really need to create regional approaches that allow us to have some greater flexibility in the application of these programs. Thank you so much. And finally, quickly, rural broadband. Um, obviously, I'm grateful for your continued advocacy. The ReConnect program is a key part of that work, and I appreciate your focus on ReConnect. After the October announcement about making $1.15 billion available through ReConnect, I, I did hear, though, from a number of community-based rural broadband providers. Um, can you briefly describe why USDA decided to deprioritize those community providers? And are you open to working uh, with the committee uh, to uh, ensure that they, uh, we have funding for all rural broadband providers? Well, uh, I think the, the challenge here with these resources is to make sure that we are providing opportunity in a balanced way. And, and, and that's what we attempted to do with our, our third uh, tranche. Of, uh, and we learn from each uh, application process what we need to focus on for the next application process. So this is an ongoing iterative process, uh, and, and we learn, which is why we established uh, some of the criteria for, for round three. No doubt uh, some of those criteria will be applied to round four. There may be new criteria. Uh, we'll listen, we'll learn, and we'll attempt to try to do the very best job of making sure these resources provide as much assistance and help and expanding as much access to meaningful broadband as possible. The general lady from Louisiana, yep. Ms. Letlow, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Scott. Mr. Secretary, as I traveled throughout the 5th Congressional District, I continue to hear concerns from Louisiana farmers about the many challenges currently facing the agriculture industry. Cost of production is on the rise and fertilizer prices have continued to climb to near record high levels. This is a troublesome trend. Rice is one of the top commodities in my district and the state. As you well know, rice is a high input cost crop with a very particular infrastructure and equipment needs and it has an outsized impact on local economies. That's why I asked the Agriculture and Food Policy Center at Texas A&M University to conduct a study to determine the economic impacts of input prices using their 64 representative farms, including a grain farm located in my district. Here's a copy of the study. This report found that there will be a significant impact on the cost of input, both on the whole farm level and per acre varying by commodity. Rice farms experienced the highest fertilizer cost increase averaging 62.04 per acre, and our other crops are not far behind. Further exacerbate, exacerbating the situation is the fact that rice farmers have not seen the increase in commodity price, much like other crops. Compared to the 2020 prices recorded by the Economic Research Service, the current market price for rice is relatively static since the last year, up just 4%. I'd also point out that traditional farm bill programs are not designed to react to these economic challenges. Secretary Vilsack, I sent your office a letter with a copy of this report enclosed. I ask that you review the analysis in its entirety and examine the negative implications of reduced net farm income due to increased cost of production. Last September, USDA announced a set of investments to address the challenges facing America's agriculture producers, including $500 million to provide relief from agriculture market disruption. As part of this initiative, one area of focus included the availability and cost of certain materials. However, we have yet to see any outcomes further detailing the implementation of these funds. Mr. Secretary, can you provide this committee with an update on the implementation of these funds and any action USDA is taking to help our agriculture producers in addressing the impact of increased energy and input costs? Well, we are in the process of, uh, I think, finalizing uh, the opportunity to use a portion of the $500 million that you referred to uh, to assist uh, in uh, dealing with some of the supply chain challenges that we face, particularly as it relates to exports, and we're looking forward to that. I have actually seen the study that you've alluded to. Uh, in fact, I, was, I looked at it last night uh, in preparation for this hearing, uh, and it's a challenge. There's no question about it. Uh, I think there are multiple ways to deal with this. There's no short term. Uh, we, we, we faced a similar situation, I think, back in 2014-15 with high fertilizer prices. Uh, uh, I think one thing we need to do is take a look at ways in which we can be less dependent on outside sources and resources. 
uh, for these materials so that we don't face export controls as we're facing today, which, which, uh, which is an issue. Uh, I think we obviously have to continue to address the supply chain challenges that we face to the extent that that's contributing to it, additional port hours, uh, truck drivers with the things we've discussed earlier today. And I think we have to continue to equip farmers with information and technology and, and the capacity uh, to produce more with less. Uh, I think that's part of the challenge as well. Uh, there's no silver bullet. I wish there were, and if there were, we would certainly be on top of it. Well, thank you for reviewing this study, and I look forward to receiving your formal response to my letter and working with you to help alleviate the lasting effects of supply chain disruptions. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the remainder of my time. The gentleman from California, Mr. LaMaffa, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the time here, and uh, thank you, Secretary, for your extensive time with us uh, in this committee today. Appreciate the efforts. Uh, I know you got to, my understanding, make a trip out west um, a little bit later today, so I hope we can find a way to resolve some of California's water supply and water storage issues out there on that conversation. So um, let, let me let me cover a couple of things really fast in the beginning here. Um, we have, uh, yeah, as has been mentioned by several other members here, but I feel obligated to is that uh, Payments that need to be getting out to, to growers here, we're, we're hearing about especially in some of our Northern California counties, it might have something to do with um, staff issues in, in some of the counties on, uh, I don't know if it's you know COVID related or what have you, but uh, the, the dollars are just not getting out the door of the original uh, 10 billion for the wildfire drought and other natural disasters we've had the last couple of years. It's been uh, well over 100 days on that, and so they're wondering why isn't it getting out the door. So please your attention on that, especially with the Northern California FSA offices. And also as an aside too, uh, with our ag products that are uh, stuck on a dock, stuck in containers, California, or many of our nut growers are really, really suffering on exports. And so uh, whatever push you as secretary can do, sir, to uh, get our trade representatives and enforce our trade uh, agreements we have, China and them, whenever we got empty containers going back or sometimes ships with no containers on them, that's a real problem because our products need to be going on those ships back and somehow have some semblance of a balance of trade. And so whatever push the USDA can have with the, our other trade reps would be greatly appreciated because our almond growers, walnut growers, they're just getting killed as this stuff sitting on the docks and in storage, and it's gonna carry over in the following years and just smash the price on those products. So, uh, sir, let me let me shift gears to our forestry issues now. Um, you know, one fire, just one fire in my district was right out a million acres last year, it's called the Dixie Fire. Um, I uh, wanna see if the Forest Service, we can press them to come up, up their targets for timber work for the coming year. Do you see the agency harvesting in 2022 in any fashion a significant increase you know how how, how important is this do you think uh, as far as our timber harvesting for rural economy obviously as we still need wood and paper products in this country nice to, nice to have them domestically produced and forest health so what do you, what do you think about those sir well i would say that the 10-year uh, plan that we announced uh, earlier this week uh, speaks to the opportunity for the forest service uh, to do a lot more work in a lot of different areas uh, across the board to make our forests healthier and more resilient. So I think you can expect to anticipate much more work and you're going to be focusing uh, as well on making sure that we reduce the risk to communities and, and people from uh, these horrific fires. And over time, I think we can reduce the risk and the size of these fires. Uh, it's going to take some time, but we, uh, with these resources from the infrastructure bill, we're now in a, process, now in a position to be able to do much, much more. Um, I, let me just say on the export issue, we are addressing that and I think in the very near future we'll have at least some, uh, some opportunity to try to resolve this. I think the Port of Oakland is underutilized uh, out there on the West Coast and I think there's an opportunity there for us to, to, to work in concert with that port uh, to see if we can do something about those empty containers. And on the WIP Plus uh, program, uh, those, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're trying to simplify the process so we can get resources out to folks as quickly as possible using existing NAP and RMA data 
uh, and or uh, livestock forage data to, uh, to get payments to people uh, hopefully in the spring and summer of this year. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, it'll be good to see if some of these dollars can get out there for uh, uh, the forestry we're talking about. But yeah, we do have staffing issues, it seems to come down to whether it's FSA offices and we've had forest service offices that don't even bother to open up for months. It's simple things like Christmas tree permits in some of my counties are very difficult to get out the door with, uh, with that. So we got to look at staffing more and not have such a clamp down because of COVID situation. So um, the, uh, on, on forestry, coming back to that, this is a big deal. I talk about that the most. Um, the uh, hazardous fuel reduction in the wildland urban areas can be, uh, uh, they need, we need commercial partners. And in the recent Build Back Act, uh, they were restricted from having commercial partners. Is that something that we can uh, be more aggressive on and having, you know, there's, there's not enough forest service time or personnel or dollars. Commercial users can help do that. Well, a portion of the infrastructure bill does provide resources to the state and local governments uh, to be able to to uh, partner with us. And so obviously there'll be opportunities there as well. Not just, not just governments, I'm sorry, but with actual, you know, logging industry out there. I'm sorry, I've got the red light. I'm not sure. What I'm the, the professional loggers out there, the commercial industry, they, they can do much more than the government can do. How come we can't partner with them more so? Well, I think, they, I think they will be engaged and have been engaged and will continue to be engaged uh, because of the additional resources that are now available. That Some of these contracts have been pretty expensive, which, which has limited the amount of work that we've been able to do. Uh, there's a whole other discussion about wood products, and I think there's an important opportunity there uh, for us to expand significantly the use of wood in construction. Okay, Thank well, you. Let's see if we can Your balance through then on the gentleman's time has expired. Back better restriction on that. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Before we adjourn today, I want to invite our ranking member to share any closing comments he may have. Well, first of all, Chairman, thank you to you uh, for this hearing and extending the invitation to the secretary. And secretary, thank you uh, for your leadership and uh, and being with us here today on Capitol Hill uh, and joining us. Uh, we, you know, we appreciate your time and look forward to partnering with you on the important work ahead. I know it's a full plate when you look at the, the responsibilities of the Department of Agriculture. Um, and uh, more than, obviously the food is important, but it's so much more uh, in the scope of, of what you do and what we do on this committee. And so that partnership, I think, is really important. I also want to extend my appreciation to your team and talented professionals at the department. I, want to, I do want to also say specific thank you for FSIS Administrator Paul uh, Kicker. Uh, he has been um, uh, great at just in Pennsylvania alone of, you know, on this issue of, of protein processing, of getting out with his team and and I appreciate the visit to Bell and Evans Chicken, that's poultry, uh, and appreciate uh, the visit to Nicholas Meats, uh, which is on the cattle side. And so he's been really hands-on and, and just really uh, a, a great communicator uh, and a great partner. Uh, in closing, I do want to put a finer point on one issue. Mr. Secretary, it is a concern in Congress that when any secretary acts unilaterally with the CCC, and in fact, we've seen Congress limit your powers of this office when when this authority is abused. Uh, there have been limited details made available to us related to the climate program you've described. And I know you identified two sections specifically. And earlier in response to a question from Representative Austin Scott, you stated you're very confident in your legal authority, and that's an assured statement given this program seemingly is being created unilaterally and out of whole cloth as we speak. Now, I, I will stress that this committee remains skeptical of the legal authority provided to you and your office under the CCC for this program. And looking at the enumerated powers in the act, we think that no amount of mental gymnastics could, could get you there. That said, uh, this committee would like more details from you on this program, but we also want to hear specifically from OGC on the exact language that provides you the authority under the Charter Act, and, and, and we, we want to hear from you prior to any funds being obligated. Is that something I can get a commitment from? We'll be happy to share uh, the details of this program with you, uh, Congressman, and, and uh, also uh, provide you with the, the uh, you know, the, the basis upon which we believe that this is an appropriate use of these resources. 
I, I will tell you, it's, we're not putting anything at risk here in terms of our ability to do everything else that's important for the, the CCC. Um, and I think, again, I would point out that major farm organizations have called upon us to do exactly what we're doing in exactly the form we're doing it. That's the, and that's, you know, that's the Farm Bureau, it's major commodity groups. So we're trying to be responsive to what we're hearing on the outside here uh, and look forward to working with you to, uh, to, to uh, get you to a place where you're a bit more comfortable with this. But at the end of the day, we're going to have to do this. We're going to have to get engaged in this. And I'll tell you why we have to get engaged. Yeah, to the extent we're concerned about export markets, my previous stint when I worked for the dairy industry, our competitors are absolutely going to make this a marketing advantage. We got to get there first. Right. Uh, I, and I couldn't agree with you more. I encourage you to check out the Sustains Act, and we're, we want to be there right here with you. We've already been working very aggressively in this space with bills. So I want to just thank you for that, and thank you for your time today, Mr. Secretary, and for the commitment to you and the professionals at USDA to be ready to work together on continued oversight and preparation for the next Farm Bill. Once again, Mr. Chairman, thanks for holding this hearing, and I yield back. Thank you. As I bring this great and very informative hearing to a close today, I first want to thank you, Secretary Vilsack. Your testimony was brilliant. It truly was. It was well prepared and well received on our end. And we thank you for that. This has been a four hour hearing and uh, we appreciate your time and your commitment. And uh, I'm just looking forward to continuing to work with you and the USDA on all of the things that we have worked on. And uh, so thank you again, and God bless you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Under the rules of the committee, the record of today's hearing will remain open for 10 calendar days to receive additional material and supplementary written responses from the witnesses to any questions posed by a member. This hearing of the Committee of Agriculture is now adjourned. <laughs>